Santiago here with me. Great. So I think we'll turn um, off just trying to get this room presented working here. So how do we get the monitor? It's really it's probably easy if I did teams, but because we're not doing teams, it's confused. So it's steve.lasker at microsoft.com. I got a bunch of Microsoft guests here. Aaron. To create a guest account mm -hmm. and uh, put okay, I'll put it. Okay, so what's your email, Steve? Steve, uh, Steve LAS at Microsoft.com. Steve.lasco works also. All right, so first, the most obvious. Thank you for coming. I appreciate you guys, especially from last minute. I don't know how last minute this was, but thank you for coming. Okay. Um, I haven't come through yet. And uh, so this is obviously you want to follow up on the <coughs> – wait, what? Roger's saying they know he's from Amazon, but they won't let him check in. <laughs> what? Do you mind grabbing, going down to the desk and letting you get Raja sure. to bring him up? Sure, sure. Um, Niaz Khan may also be down there. If you can Niaz. kill Niaz Khan. Niaz Khan. Then, and Raja. Raja. Right. Okay. Thank yeah. you. You want me to come with you? All right. You want me to come with you? Sure. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm watching for the request. So, um, anyway, so. Uh, we just wanted to pick up where we left off. Um, I think I tried to put together an agenda. Obviously, just a starting point where we should all. 
Another agenda for us to kind of talk about one of which was I was hoping we can close down the scenarios this way we can um, uh, start getting to the fun part of the design conversations and making sure they re re relate back to the scenarios so um, we have the scenarios I think we're in pretty good shape I talked to Justin this morning who's on the call thankfully and um, I was also taking your it was I think there was one more scenario that actually came up a few days ago when I was having another discussion, which um, was around um, um, it's a kind of um, in total like scenario. It's a situation where um, the registry has built an image on behalf of someone right. and um, might want to sign that they have built it correctly from the identified build instructions because the, the, the question has come up actually with a few people recently like so there's this image on the registry but I have no idea whether it's actually filled or what it says it is or not so you can see the docker file for the build say but you have no idea is really that or someone just pushed something else well and so is there, if, if the registry has a build service and all the, mm -hmm. the provider has like Microsoft has built it and their pipeline or GitHub has built right. it. Right, some and kind of build service. Some sort of build service it should be able to potentially validate that they did actually follow those instructions and built it. Um, and therefore, the um, it's it's kind of in total like use case where you're trying to say this is I followed I followed these instructions and did the build, but you're not actually signing for the for the actual content per se. I mean, this sounds sort of equivalent to the CI system use case where you've got something that's going to do the build and maybe you've got a claim attached to it that is the Docker file or the context that you built from or something like that. Yeah. Yes, that's, so the way I was trying to, and by the way, I had a good conversation with um, uh, a guy from Google who does their, what do they call it, their Binary authorization service, yeah. Wilfried, um, really good guy. He was trying to make it, but he was here on vacation and his, said he wouldn't stay married. Well, I shouldn't be, we got recording. So anyway, he wanted to make it, I'll just put it that way. And he had some good feedback on, we're talking about identities as a whole. And he, it was a broader set of identities, but basically one of the things we said is regardless of whether the binary itself has an identity, each system, whether it's you as Justin or the build server, it always has an identity so it can be traced back to how the thing was built or what was the entity that built it. So is how is that different than what Sam was just saying is like it's the build in, the build server, this scenario number one. Actually that's locally that's, that's sorry, it's two. Yeah, so so I just think I'd like to to maybe try to tease apart here, which I think might be at the heart of this, is there's there's a difference between like a saying you performed a step and having someone potentially compromise the step itself or compromise the keys or other things used in the step. Um, and I think that, that one way to do this with the scenarios to maybe like try to move forward with this would be to outline um, for the scenarios what happens if uh, things go wrong in different ways in that process? Because then you can understand, I mean, there's certain cases you're not gonna cover. You're not gonna cover a case that, um, you, you know, we're probably not intended to cover a case where like every crypto algorithm in the world is, is broken because of, I don't know, some quantum crypto plus um, lattice based breakthrough that happens all at once. But at least sort of understanding this a little better for the common scenarios and the common types of attacks, I think would be. We don't have the camera. Maybe yeah. cool. uh, I'm sorry, we had uh, Justin, we had people coming in. Uh, so I want to make sure, can you just repeat that? Now we were also, sorry we don't have the camera uh, because we're using uh, Zoom. I hadn't figured out how to connect the camera to it and everything. So uh, basically you were describing the compromise 
key scenario, if I understand it. Yeah, it's 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 compromised keys or compromised servers or other things like this. I think just just having those scenarios as part of what's walked through, rather than um, a scenario saying, "Oh, like uh, Joe at the build server signed something," but explicitly having a scenario saying, "Like Joe at the build server's key was compromised. How do we get back to a known state?" Because the difference is. Um, like, you know, having to talk through the way in which you go from a bad state where Joe has lost his key to a good state, or to think about situations about, well, Joe lost his key, but what does that really mean? Is Joe losing his key the same as, um, you know, does that just mean that, that you know, Joe's one action might not, uh, you know, could have been performed by somebody different or something? and you know, but still had to get validated, you know, like there still had to be some validation, like someone still had to break into the server farm and then, you know, have compromised Joe's key and then do something? Or is it like the same as, you know, stealing like a, a root key um, from a, like a, a root CA key or something like that on the internet where, you know, all bets are off for most sites you go to. Um, you know, so I, I, think, I think looking at it through that lens might be helpful. Are these, well, first, is that the scenario you were thinking of? Or are you talking about a different one? No, that's right. I think it's probably included in. Okay. Let's, let's, let's assume. Um, so, is it, so is this really like, regardless, basically, a key got compromised is kind of the, the issue. So, anything that had been signed with it in the past, and anything, because we don't necessarily know when, well, I guess maybe we do know when it was compromised, or maybe, there, maybe there's a pivot there. But certainly anything from the date it was found to be compromised, which it might be a month ago, to some future state, that key should be revoked. Is that right? It, uh, and yes, then, but it's also it, but it's also a matter of how you revoke it. Because if there's someone who, for instance, you know, if, if an attacker can man in the middle all your traffic, um, which which you know, so there, I mean, there's different keys used in different places. And how they're used and what happens with them. So it's all different. If it's, um, you know, like a, uh, you know, a, a key that's just used internally as part of signing something, as part of a build step in your build farm, and you have um, artifacts from different. Sorry, it's not you. It's me. It's just kind of weird. We're talking about security stuff, and somebody's phone sounds like an alarm. <laughs> There's a security issue. That's the key. Okay, just to continue. Sorry, right. I, not having a camera is actually kind of really sad at this point because that would have been funny to see. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right, I guess two peas. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, so sorry. So the the point I was trying to make is is that it's it matters which key is compromised where. It matters what things are signed with that key, where it's used, how it's validated. And as you rightfully point out, it matters when it was compromised. But it also matters how you go from the bad state you're in when you find out that that key, which is being used currently, has been compromised, to getting back to a good state where that key is no longer trusted and you have actually finished with the revocation. Uh, because the you know, the, the desire to want to revoke something is good, but you have to actually, you know, make it to that point in a way that ideally your users are not at risk. Because for instance, if you just had one key, let's just say there was the one key that Microsoft used, the, the one GPG key they used to sign everything, right? Um, right. If, then, and someone compromised that, and that was also, you know, you, you didn't use HTTPS to go to download your updates. It was just, if they were signed with this key, you just trusted them. Then there's a question of how do you securely get from this key having been leaked to, you know, a situation where the key is no longer trusted because you can't just push an update with the bad key because the bad guy could, have, could push an update with the bad key. Right. If they can man in the middle your your users because you're not you're not doing anything to make that not occur. So um, I don't know if that makes sense. So I think that the high level from a scenario point of view is keys got compromised. One or more keys got compromised. We don't 
I, we don't necessarily know the timeline. We might know a timeline, so you might be able to make some smarter decisions around that. But really the question is, how do you get from, hey, everything that had this previous Microsoft cert to here's the new state, state of things that all those things are now re-signed and re-good um, in a good state. Is that basically the scenario? Yeah, that, that's definitely a big part of it. And how do you get clients to not trust that to know they're not supposed to trust that key anymore um, from right. the state they're in where they currently trust the key. That, that's, that's in many ways often a bigger problem than just internally switching and resigning things. So I think it, I don't think I gave it enough justice in the scenarios today, but I think there, there at least was at one point something about a bad key or it, it's not. So I'll make sure that we have uh, not only this state, but what to do about revoking a key as, as a whole. And more importantly, the problem is we've been talking about how we can move content from these public registries to registries that don't have internet connectivity or, and they're still on a public cloud, but there's been put in a VNet that they explicitly do not have access to where the image might have started, where the artifact might have started from. So we need to make sure that the scenarios we talk about, especially in the uh, air gap state or network restricted state or whatever I called it, um also have the ability to move revocation notification into that environment does that kind of cover yeah i i think that's oh, that's another tricky scenario to deal with like we, we call it the submarine scenario we got the submarine under the water that then you have to revoke yep. things. yeah exactly um yeah and i, I we think there's submarines and i was just saying we used to use submarines also and it, um, and it, the problem with that is it makes it sound much more esoteric and it's an area that we want to be able to take care of, but it's not a real top priority. One of the things we've just seen, and I'm guessing as other registry operators have seen this as well, is our, most of our customers want their environments in VNetted environments that do not have public access. So it's becoming like beyond the prototyping phase, if you get into any kind of production phase, a large majority of them are putting their production workloads into network restricted environments. So it's, that's the only downside of using the submarine snare. It sounds really cool and people want to do, but like, ah, it's not really that my problem. Virtual submarines are everywhere. Now. Yeah, virtual submarines, exactly. We, we need to solve the virtual submarine. <laughs> so uh, Justin, I'm sorry, you started to say something else though. No, I was just going to say, no, I, I think that's an important, like that, that's one of the great things about doing the scenario exercise is you come up with cases like this and then Later, if you say something like, oh, well, why don't you just, you know, use, um, yeah, wh why don't you just use GPG and TLS? Then it's like, well, right. Um, right. GPG would work in the submarine case, kind of, but, you know, it doesn't give you a lot of the other properties you want. And TLS definitely may not be what you want, um, at least with, uh, you know, you, you can't go outside to, to check timeliness of things using that. So, no, yeah, that's a great point. Okay, so um, all right, so we definitely have one vote for uh, the this scenario we just described, which I've got in the notes. Did this incorporate this incorporates the one that you had put in the comments, right? A little bit. Um, I, I put that more as like a as sort of like a test pilot uh, balloon sort of you know attempt to put one in, um, and I, I'd like to add like quite a few more where we look at compromises and problems in different areas. I, I think that, like I said before, some of this sort of is like mildly duplicative, but it's a different view on often something that's said in another scenario because you have to get from a bad situation to a good situation, again, rather than just say, oh, we should do all these things in a good situation. Um, so I, I'd like to, you know, either I or somebody else um, I, you know, would love to have other people chip in too and just say, what happens if, you know, person X does this? We have to have a secure way to get out of this, this problem. And we should make sure that the damage that, you know, a bad person can cause is, is reduced. Okay. Um, do you want to, I, I, I'm happy to do it one of two ways. I can incorporate this in the words that I can remember from how we do this. Do you, uh, you can make uh, whatever the comment that you can, I can click the button that accepts your scenario. Um, we can 
do it either way. Just let me know which one you want to do it, and we'll make, get that one merged in. Uh, there was another, you know, from a scenario perspective, there was another section that you were, gave some good feedback that um, we were having a discussion of whether that should move into a threat model doc. Yeah, I think we, we should definitely have a separate threat model doc because it's, it doesn't make sense to mix it. With, it's just it's, it's difficult to actually edit these things in pull requests and in everything in the same doc. It's easier if there more docs merged and then we just we merge them right. keep re and keep editing pull requests against them rather than just trying to keep editing because editing in pull requests is kind of horrible. Yeah. So, uh, Justin, I, I'll, I'll leave that one to you also. Uh, and I'm, there's no opinion one way or the other. Just need to know to make sure we're not duplicating work and not avoiding the thing getting done. If you want to make a, a threat model .md, you know uh, that you know a PR on that, that would be awesome. If not, we can do it here. Although I think certainly the Justins, if not Sam's and others, could be better at doing threat models than what I would. Think about. But I think the other thing too, um, Justin, if you're going to open that, if you bias toward putting less in it to start with, and then we can iterate it on, on it just so we can get something merged. So, so maybe something to do is, um, like, I'm happy to have someone just take the text I've proposed as a starting point, and just just like using that as as the as the draft like threat model. I think that would be fine. Um, and and then we can. Okay. I mean. Not a lot of text. It has, I don't know, maybe uh, maybe ten lines or something. Um, and and I, I guess I wanted because we're kind of while we're still on the sort of scenario separation things like this. I also uh, wondered if we might have a quick chat about. Uh, sorry, I, I'm not. If if I'm going too far off topic too early, let me know. But I, I also thought we might have a chat about what does and doesn't belong in scenarios because. I fell into the trap that I pointed out earlier um, unintentionally with, with what I was writing. And I, I wonder how we should separate design from scenarios because I, I feel like sometimes the line gets blurred. No, that's a great point. I, I think it'd be good to work on something like a scope table for talking about what we want to have in this and what we want to have out of it. Is, is that like, um, I, I don't think I've used one of those in one of these contexts before. Can you say a little more? And I'm sorry, I don't know who's. Uh, that, that's just, sorry, can I, I just want to confirm the speaker, the room is there. Can you hear Sam good? I don't know where the microphone, I think they're up in the ceiling. Are you able to hear us okay? I, I'm doing fine with audio. Okay, okay. okay. So this is Sam speaking. Um, I, I'm just talking about enumerating the things that we want to have in scope for what we're talking about with notary and image signing in general and what we think is out of scope. So if we, you know, where do we feel about key distribution, for example, is a, a, a thing that we need to figure out if it's in scope or if it's out of scope. At the risk of turning this into a full PM below the line, above the line type of a thing. But yeah. at the same time, as we're kind of going through this process, there's going to be good ideas that are worth tracking and planning to get to at some point and things that we intend to get to that we won't and want to make some trade-offs for. So probably going to just start to track that overall. Yeah. I, I think uh, what Justin Kapos Cap is saying that was a little different. Like what you're talking about is like what I was trying to scope in another document with the picture, like policy management is not something we want to take on. We want to support. Key management is a little bit of a quirk. I'll take key management out, but you know, policy management or even SBOM is something that I don't think we should take on as an SBOM here. We want to make sure we can sign SBOMs, so we don't have to bet on one and overlap with the other efforts. But I think what Jeff think we're asking is how do we tease out what's a scenario versus a technology conversation? Is that what you were suggesting, Justin? Yes, but um, before we switch back to that, I, I want to ask one thing: is there's a goals and a non-goals? Uh, like subsections of the scenarios document, I think, if, if I remember right, which I think also tries to address some of the scoping issue. Is that is that the right place for those things, or am I misremembering and there isn't actually such a thing? I think that would be good to like flesh out, maybe move into a separate document. So I think that that's related to what I'm talking about in terms of scope. What what do we want to do as part of this, and what don't we want to do? Okay. 
Yeah, and, and, and Steve, thank you for bringing the conversation back. Yeah, I, what I was trying to say is, in some of the scenarios, like the error that I made when I put my scenario in, is I said, um, you know, that when you have a repository compromise, like a repository is compromised and there's an HSM in there that has a key in it and that's also able to be used by the attacker. And um, I more meant that uh, what I should have written is I should have basically said, and, and any keys on that server, including, you know, if there happened to be an HSM, you know, or, or other sorts of protection, or maybe even just leaving that aside, I'm, I'm kind of trying to figure out where we draw the line in terms of, because um, in your example, you, in your I mean, example, so you, design. I was just saying, do you mean being able to use a key for a period of time versus being able to compromise a key? I mean, because I think in yeah. a general sense, those things are in. It, it, I mean, those are definite parts of the threat model. But it yeah. isn't. Uh, hold on, let me give a worse example of the problem that I created, and maybe then you'll understand what I'm trying to say, because I think I'm people talking past each other. But here's a really bad example, which is to say that, um, that suppose a server has their, uh, has their local GPG key signed that they use during the, um, uh, you know, the Travis build that uh, generated in total metadata and loaded this into Tuff, which then got read by an OPA policy. Like, you know, so there, what I'm doing is I'm being very specific about my design of this crazy yeah. nonsensical yeah. system I just described and then proposing a problem with it. And what I'm saying is, is that I think for the scenarios, we're trying to leave the scenarios generic so that we're not presupposing yeah. A bunch of like you know an HSM or or like tough in Toto Opa any of this stuff and you know maybe right. some of those things end up in the actual design in the end but that's not where like the scenario doesn't seem like that's where they belong. Um, yeah, yeah, so and I tripped up on the same thing initially. Like I had Kubernetes sprinkled in, I don't know if I had Opa or not, and Sam kind of called me on it. So that was the the major iteration I did was the generalized thing, which of course spawned into hey. We need some icons that are generalized as well, um, so that I could represent these. So I, I do think we wanted to, because it kind of goes back to something I wrote up, uh, just the whole separation of concerns thing is, like, we want a, an SBOM solution because we think that's important to the engine and scenarios. I don't know if we really want to get into betting on IBMs versus Red Hats versus the 3 T S SBOM versus anybody else that wants to come up with one, right? It's like. Look, you can, we want to make sure you can stick S-bombs in a registry because we have this you know, way to link things together with artifacts and they should be signed because an S-bomb that's not signed is kind of meaningless. Um, and that, that's kind of like the scope of what we want to take on. I think, and then we just got to all be careful to not bring specific technologies into uh, the scenarios only because we're trying not to taint it in one direction or another. I do think that the design conversations I mean, I think we'll, we might reference some at times, for example, but even that, like, I, I think we need a reference implementation. Um, and that's why even for key management, I was suggesting. I mean, we're going to, once we've done the design, we're going to have, we can get some concrete instantiations of what right. they were actually implying real world. Yep. And so, OPA and, okay. you know, and whoever key thingy, like, they, I think we, our right. reference implementation need to be open source. Like, I think we all would agree to that. As much yeah. as, You'd love to be AWS and Azure and so on and so forth or Docker. Um, we should make sure that anybody can validate these. And then what will be interesting is when, like, uh, I think it was Josh actually was bringing it up. We want to make sure that the keys can be managed by the cloud vendors, you know, solution. And we need to figure out what the extensibility model is for that. We shouldn't have notary have a, a key, the public, sorry, the private key, like embedded in it. We should be able to leverage those vendors' solutions. Uh, how we do it, I don't know. Um, but again, that's that's just that's just that's, that's requirement. That's requirements. Requirements. That's right. requirements. Right. I mean, that's requirements about um, um, I mean, they should be relatively straightforward because they're just like straightforward requirements about we will only require. You know, we won't. 
Well, that didn't require signing. We won't require you to uh, embed the private key in the. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then yeah, I, I, I mean, see like, coming out of the yeah, design. Like, sorry, the design conversations. Yeah. So, I think just because we want to, you know, just kind of move on in our base is. I think we're already starting to transition to some of the design and some of the requirements part, which is great. Other than this one other thing, actually I won't even say one of the, like this is locked. That's the point of being able to make new PRs. If we can get this one last scenario in, do we think we're at a point where we can, you know, merge that PR? We should merge it, so I can't, it's impossible to read it without merging it, that's the thing. So until, until it's merged, <laughs> you can't actually really read it and decide Okay, so why don't we do this? I think we're just suggesting it's merge what we I have. I actually think we should just merge everything. Okay. Uh, we should take Justin's chunk and stick it into the another PL. And right, so that merge well. what's in there already yeah. with whatever edits. I think I've caught up with everybody's edits. So, so uh, take out Justin's comments, which are the threat model piece, put right. into another PR, okay. merge all that, and then we can, then it's, then we can then it's much easier to sit and read. Okay. We can maybe read it now. Yeah, I actually did. I mean, yeah, there is that view file. I know, but it's still, still confusing. It's still confusing because you get interrupted by the comments. Yeah, that's true. Oh, wait, so I, I think we're saying two things. Add, you know, and then I can always uh, add other scenarios or we can dump other things in there too after yeah, that. Completely. Yeah, completely. There's no reason why, you know, this has to be the perfect thing the first time we merge. No, no. Okay, did I also hear somebody signing up to take on the threat model? I mean, I can, I can just put it out there. Like a, um, create a PR for the threat yeah, model? Yeah, I can. Okay. So this is what I'm referring to, Justin. There's that view yeah. file. So if you look yeah, at it here. I know, but it's like, it's like, I just wanted to be in a state where everyone's. Um, the problem here is you can't see the comments. So that's the, I usually want to put like split screen set up. All right, so are you signing up for doing yeah, the threat model, Martin? Yeah. Are you doing it now? <laughs> okay. All right, that's good. While Justin's multitasking, um, I will uh, later on I'll merge the or give it a break, whatever, I'll merge the current one and then we'll um, you can do a separate PR for the other scenario. And uh Kapos, did you want to do the additional PR for the additional scenario? Or do you want me to just write it up because you're busy with other stuff? I, I think like uh I can probably step in and and at least take cut at some of those. Um I, I'm really hoping okay. Sam and others keep me honest. In case I slip in more HSMs or things, which, which by the way, it's not that people actually use those with tough as as far as we're really aware of. But um, I'll try to uh, try to keep it general. Santiago may pitch in too. I would think really the supply chain expert. Sure, I'll, I'll be more than happy to take a look. Uh, I've been waiting a little bit to see how things crystallize, and, uh, and then I'll be more than happy to jump in. Okay. I don't think you have to ever worry about people uh, jumping in and providing feedback. That is definitely not been a problem. So uh, we have a great group of people that are doing that. Uh, Trisha, can you hear us okay? I, oh, good yep. now. Okay, yep. great. Yep. So just, Much better, uh, thanks. Okay. Um, okay, so I think we're good on scenarios. I feel like we're offering ice cream now so we can get to the design conversations because it was certainly a, a, a good doc that uh, Sam put out and we can iterate on that conversation. You had some stuff you had been working on as well. So do you want to finish that up? Or do you want me to, do you want to, sorry. I, I didn't okay. want to throw you under while you're already no, I'm gonna asking. This now. Okay. Oh, you already have a threat model. I just put it in. I told you I was going to do it now. Oh, okay. So I thought you were doing the other one. Okay. All right. So we now have a threat model. What do you want to do about the requirements? The scenarios, rather. Just mer literally okay. just merge everything. Okay. All right. And. Uh, 
Have you, do you think you've made all the changes to? I uh, have all the question. typos. I got everything because I caught the stuff that Sam. That's the caught Sam's questions about multi-tenant registry and. That was the documents and terms. That's a different one, which I have as a separate agenda item. I, I think I agree with Justin that we can just merge everything and then we can iterate on it from there. Okay. And we can remove things if we need to, and we can add things if we need to. Okay. If that makes sense. So uh, I just want to keep it a little sequential, just to be fair, keep everybody up to date. So I got the end end scenarios in here as well. So now we have the scenarios, the threat model, and I'll clean up the readme to point, make sure we keep a good table of contents on that. So that's good. Um, the next one, I did have the definitions and terms. You had brought up some questions. I did want to, I, I, well, we can decide whether everybody's involved in that conversation. We can just cash it out. Um, let me bring that one up. But before I, because this is also just more of a housekeeping thing. What were you saying? Well, there's a bunch of comments, and there might be ones read them as comments, or maybe we just want to merge it and then just have the discussion. I don't. Well, I, to I don't be know, fair, I want to be careful not to, because I am really bad about this. I will have incomplete thoughts sometimes in my own notes, and it makes reading for others really confusing. I did want to make sure that we had something that people are looking at the repo and the root can make sense of it. Um, but I also want to be careful that people are reading the repo directly don't see a complete scattered mindset of where we're at. Uh, yeah, so I think we should make a very large disclaimer in the readme saying that this is work in progress. Sorry, that's work in progress and not to be taken as anything at this point. <laughs> so let's, let's just make an action to do that. Okay. Let me put that back in the um, okay, so. so yeah, there's a bunch of things that I, yeah, I think we need to very much discuss about these. But the things that we've got so far. That okay, so scenarios. I want to be. I'm, what I'm trying to do is also make sure we're capturing this for others that are going to listen later and look at the notes, because um, not everybody could make it to the meeting. Scenarios, depth, and terms, and uh, uh, threat model. Okay. So I was going to go to the definition of terms next. Do we want to talk about something else before I do that? Well, do we want to just read through what's here? We can do that. Just um, for five minutes. To yeah, let me, let me. The scenario, I mean. The threat model is tiny. That's just the scenarios. Mainly. Oh, you might be the scenarios. Okay. Scenarios and threat model. Okay. Let's do that. Just see if. Uh, What is your process in Amazon to know when everybody's done reading is like you put your hand up or something? You guys are much better about this. Okay. Yeah, I kind of like assume that there's some period of time that allows us enough to read it and say, all right, how's everyone doing? Okay, I think <laughs> school readers are more careful readers, not feel bad. 
<laughs> you just made them feel bad. Yeah, there was no <laughs> one. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> there a pattern of you hear the noise of clacking keys to be a little bit more. Oh, As opposed to scrolling keys. You know, they're probably chatting with someone else. <laughs> they're probably done. Good. Yes. I think there are some scenarios missing. I'm sure. And I think what would you like to quite specifically? So okay, so we go back over here. Um, so for example all parts of scenarios maybe. I mean so for example, scenario number one for Lake Cobell mm -hmm. doesn't actually mention that um the developer might be extending their build from Ubuntu and wants to validate it's actually Ubuntu, I think it's, you know, it's Oh, okay, so it's kind of like validating the base image scenario. Yeah, and so there's, there's kind of, um, and okay. I mean, I think, uh, also, I think, I don't know, so some of the, it's kind of hard to read because there's quite a lot of there's both a lot of specificity and some general hierarchy. So it's kind of yeah. Maybe so. Just, just what else we want to? That I mean, no, it, just, it makes it hard to see what's um, I think the question is if we've all got different perspectives on it, which is perfect. That's what the diversity is good about. What's missing? And then up to that line that it gets into a specific technology reference as opposed to a, a scenario. I mean, I think. Uh, could the image be modified after it's validated and before it's actually run? The container is, is like are those scenarios we need to consider? I think the scenario we're saying is once the artist once the thing is built, regardless of what it is, that it gets signed. While yes, there is a, a point between it's built and it's signed, it could be compromised. The it could be no more. It, it could be just as compromised if the package I reference is a bad package. So we're kind of saying that. that once the signature is done, that's where the trust point begins, and whatever signed it is uh, attesting to, you know, Justin or Build Server 22, that until we know Build Server 22 is bad, we're going to assume the things it's putting together has, are valid. Um, but so this is a question of when is it validated. So how close to execution do you validate? Sorry, I didn't get your name. It's yes. N-I-A-Z. Okay. Uh, was, was that? Was that Exactly the question you're asking there, sorry. No, it's a different one. So, okay. I thought, I thought, I thought. so we pulled an image, we verified it's been signed, right? And we're about to go deploy the image. Before it gets deployed, are there uh, scenarios where that image itself could be modified? Or where you said a moment, or run. So pulled versus run boundary for validation, right? Um, I mean, I think um, that's a interesting and complicated question. I think the answer is that um, we're currently limited by um, 
the way that tooling works. I think when it's not a um, with things with most of the products, um, I mean, like things like Infinity, and, um, can't give you any guarantees after unpack. Singularity, on the other hand, does because it runs straight out of the unmodified image. So, I heard, oh, sorry. So, um, so I think that it's actually it's more a technical question, and there are potential other solutions around. Um, making sure that, I mean, it's, it's complicated to um, actually validate it after unpack it with the current architecture, but it's not a, it's a, I think it's out of scope. Can you help me, you said something there that, that's interesting um, to me is that based on the current architecture, which is like if you were working from an ideal state, current architecture aside, are those premises in scope for these discussions? I don't think they're part of, I don't think they are in scope because I think they are very runtime dependent. Yes. I, I think this depends on whether we consider the runtime in scope for the threat models of, of image signing or whether it's, whether it's the runtime's threat model itself. Like which, which thing are you modeling threats on? Um, so the, some of this relates to how images are stored and the reasons that they're stored that way relate to things like reducing transfer times and deduplicating data and compression and things like that. So typically mm -hmm. the, the artifacts that are in a uh, repository in a, in, a doc, in a registry are compressed tarballs, right? And then they're uncompressed and they're assembled into um, some sort of union file system. And the in a non reversible transform. In, yeah, in a non reversible transform. And so the process of transforming from the compressed tarball artifact, which is the signed thing, to the thing that is actually run, you, can, you typically lose the ability to then revalidate that data. Yeah, so, so this is a question. question. Hold on. Let me, uh, uh, sorry, I don't mean to, I, no, I think I just cut somebody off. Um, apologies. Uh, but um, I think this is, uh, as was pointed out, this is actually more an artifact of different design solutions than a fundamental issue in the system. Like you can actually, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to put a design in the system, but like, you know, propose a design now, but I just want to point out that um, this whole notion of you have this compressed thing and then you go to this thing that isn't compressed, but you still want to be able to validate it. You can totally do that like for instance, with Intoto metadata. So it's not, it's not entirely um, like, I, I don't think it's something that a priori we should consider this scenario to be not worth writing down. I think at a minimum we should write it down and then later if we want to declare that this is something we're not going to handle, I think we should go and then do that explicitly and say, you know, based on the design we came up with, we decided that this particular problem was out of scope. But I don't think at this stage, we necessarily need to decide everything that's in or out of scope yet. I think that that process, you know, could um, like the, the, the parts of it that are near the boundary, I think we can whittle down later if that's amenable to others. I, 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 the, part of the reason I think it should be out of scope specifically is that one of the things that we want to do is sign generic things and therefore looking at details of whether, you know, what happens to those generic things after, when they're being used just seems very non-generic. Um, because, um, I mean, it's, it's like, um, you know, apps doesn't concern itself with what you do after you've installed your binaries. It's like, it's not, it's someone else's problem. It's, I mean, maybe that's not a very good example, but it's um, like, we have to have, I mean, if we're going to just talk about generic aspects, the fact that container aspects currently have some container aspects currently have properties that are inconvenient for validation at some points. 
is I think and there is work there is discussion about fixing this in other forums um, because it requires some design changes that are a good thing in the long run but just difficult to transition the universe onto and no one's quite agreed exactly what the best design is. I think it's just kind of not a great thing to have in scope, even if we we could potentially uh, you know we we could potentially apply some some of the techniques we have to that problem, but I think we should do it in a different space. I think there's a compromise in both, right? So Sorry, I, don't I think there's a compromise in both, right? So I guess right, well, I'll just keep, I'll just run this quick. So is that perhaps we take the best of both worlds and not document it? Perhaps in parentheses appears to be out of scope for the moment, um, and and may warrant um, revisiting this at a later point in time. Yeah, I think that's what. But there's mean. something to be said about uh, if, if if we're if we're only going to be focused on the current implementations today, it's hard to advance the ball to a kind of a greater place with respect to you know offering integrity management over a set of artifacts more broadly and so yeah no, it, that is true and i mean it's something that i do get questions about so now so it's like oh you had a pre canned answer that's <laughs> well, well no, I mean, yeah i mean I, it, it, every six months someone emails security at docker and asks this question <laughs> <laughs> um and there are a lot of people who would like to fix this but there are an awful lot of solutions but I think that one of the things that's interesting is to think of what is the boundary like we've been there's a, a specific artifact type focus you know container images docker images then there's can we deliver something out of a registry at, with some sense of security to an endpoint what gets done after it's delivered is that really something we're trying to worry about and I think that's kind of what we're saying it just so happens this I mean it, well, I mean maybe I mean, maybe we do decide. I mean, there is clearly demand for um, things that provide, um, I mean, especially in the edge space, security yeah. from boot to container runtime, and that's a, an interesting problem in itself, uh, which needs. Uh, uh, but it's working with one of the. I don't think it's. I don't. Yeah, I, th I think it's. I think it has to. I think it's just a big set of problems that's probably out there. Sure, more came to mind. Well, no, no, it's kind of it's something that there is a bunch of we should maybe set up a parallel group to talk about at some point because it is something that I know that right. your, your people are interested in. Yeah. So why don't we do this? Let's let's capture this that there is a a conversation of is it two content delivery? At which point the tarballs are delivered locally, and then the Docker client in this case, or the container D client, whatever we want to call it these days, um, that extracts it is another problem space, and then we could have a discussion of whether we consider that in scope for notary as a whole, or is it, you know, how does container images deal with this problem? Because there's another topic just to uh, grab into here is. There are certain artifact types like Singularity that do have a signature signing solution. We're not, we're not suggesting they should get rid of it. We're saying that that's great for those types that have them. They should they should continue to work. Whether they choose to put it in whatever it is that we come up with, that's their choice. But I think regardless of whether it's signed or not with that proprietary or that artifact specific type, we can then provide another piece of signature that says, hey, this thing I can put in this registry, when it got moved up to this other registry, it's still signed with the same thing. The content inside it is also signed, and Singularity can continue to do with what it's doing. Well, there's also, yeah, there's also issues around that they potentially have a different track for all things that are signed. Sure. I think we just need to be careful of not trying to engineer something that maybe belongs in the runtime, while at the same time not preventing ourselves from and making that a possibility in the future to be able to leverage some additional, either where there's provenance related information or data points in the manifest or something else. We just need to make sure we go, you know, where it's possible to kind of make, add those pieces in or at least not block ourselves. We do so. And I think as we get into the conversation, we get into those areas, we'll be able to kind of net that stuff out. We just, just make sure I, I added some, when it belongs in the artifact specific runtime or I don't think when we start getting close to the, that gray area, 
we try not to kind of overreach notary into stuff that belongs in runtime. But at the same time, if we can, we should try to not block ourselves or right. design ourselves into a restriction. Compost, did that cover what you guys were? Did you just agree? Oh, uh, yeah, that, that sounds fine. <laughs> I asked if you were okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> How do you interpret it? Okay. Um, all right, so we think we're good? Um, I have put something that's in number five. Detect the occurrence of an attack. In the, that sounds like the threat model? Yeah. yeah. This one you're talking about? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay I, have, I want to ask a more Uber question around, I hate, we can't use that word either now. Um, a, a higher level question on threat model. Do we consider these the threat models that we are should consider solving for as opposed to this is the threat model and this is the answer? Like I'm assuming this is kind of the equivalent of the threat model scenarios. Yes. It's okay. a, that's what it says, like intercept all the network traffic. That's a thing that they... Exactly. Like, words, at some point, we're going to have an answer for these questions. Yes. Yeah. Okay. This is a list of threats. Yeah. Okay. This is not yeah. a modeling of like what, yeah. what they need or anything like that. Yeah. Okay. And so you're asking about this. this is the paragraph. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, Justin. I, I want to say a couple of things. So, um, I, this isn't meant to be exhaustive. I'm sure there's other things to add, and it's also not necessarily intended that every single threat can occur simultaneously. In a in like the most horrific possible way, and that the system will maintain a high level of security. So you know, if if an attacker goes and you know compromises your repository and a bunch of signing keys and a step in your software supply chain, you know, then you're probably in a lot of trouble, and your users are too. At the moment, when all hash functions are being broken. <laughs> No, I think so, I agree with all of the scenarios, but when you talk about detect the occurrence of an attack, like that's typically not something you use signatures or signing to protect against. That's more sort of like auditing and looking at what's happening in your system, right? Um, you, yes, but um, it, it sort of depends on, on how you, I, I guess the way I meant it was a little bit different, which is that, for instance, if you haven't signed something correctly, like something's not signed with the right key or something else like that happens, then you actually notify someone and, you know, it, it, it isn't, you know, it just sort of indicates that, for instance, uh, this wasn't built on our build server, right? Something is going on here. Um, that's, I think, more what I meant rather than sort of a scanning uh, sort of thing. Um, I guess you could also, like, you know, in that vein, you could also view mitigations, like, you know, people apply all sorts of rate limiting and exfiltration monitoring and other stuff like that, but that also isn't really what I meant by mitigation. Um, so I think as, as long as what we do is we're clear about, you know, to the extent at which um, attacks are able to be mitigated or um, the damage can be reduced or we can detect what's happened or whatever else. I think it, maybe it's okay, although I'm very happy to have this language tweaked. Um, I don't know if I what I said before, what you, but yeah, what, what, what I meant to say is that I'm not trying to presuppose a design of like a monitoring system or something else. You, you mean, right, yeah, so by detection you mean in effect not consuming invalid content. And flagging it as a as something that has something had happened, for example. So yeah, I mean that that was sort of what I had in mind, but I, I'm I don't necessarily think you know presupposing how that would work in a design is the best. I think we might be better off just having this as a as a goal of of the system, and then in the end, when we decide you know we're not going to build some crazy monitoring solution, and if people want to have their own, that's great. Um, 
maybe that's that's fine but then it's you know we when we see a situation where yes you should detect that in total metadata wasn't correctly signed here or you should detect that uh, opa uh, scenario wasn't loaded with the correct default policy there or something like that um, at least have those those things um, you know like kind of have that front of mind I'm, I so I try to digest it. So one of the things is we and I try to tease this out for things like the open policy, you know, the policy management and uh, scanning. Although I didn't incorporate it into the doc, is our main goal is to make sure that content that comes out of the registry is verifiable. What people do with that information is up to them. So for instance, one of the reasons I was trying to make the policy management separate is we want to make sure that we can say this is definitely the MySQL image um, by that was signed by the MySQL org, whatever that is. Um, and maybe MySQL has different build machines, so there's a subset that you could, you know. But, but that's quite, again, that's quite specific. I mean, there are, there are I mean, if you consider, you know, there are just very, there are just very simple scenarios like, I build something and I want to be sure that my cluster runs the same thing an hour later. Sure. sure. So there's, there's like there's very non specific, nothing about MySQL or anything. It's like I've I've got I've you know, I've 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 built so more things and yeah, and or, work with yeah, and you just genericize it a bit. Right? Yeah. Genericize it into the context of a marketplace scenario where an identity of a vendor mm -hmm. needs to be known. And validated, right? right. But it's not, yeah. Um, that's your question. That was a but No, I actually question, did right? capture the marketplace. I think I put uh, multiple signatures. Where was that? Actually, it was the multiple signatures. You could argue whether it should be buried here or not. Uh, approved vendor project artifact. So in this one, I talk about, I call it MyDB, trying to not reference my SQL. Um, <laughs> and it's acquired from some public registry, you know, again, avoiding Docker Hub or Quay or whatever. Uh, and I want to know that things are signed, right? And then, but I might want to say that particular one, that version, I now approve in my environment. So that, that's the second signature scenario. What I was trying to tease apart separately was um, whether some other policy manager wants to decide. I don't allow any. I won't allow something from that vendor that is, you know, uh, my my DB greater than version eight, that's a policy. All we can, all I'm saying is the scope of our team is saying, yeah. we, we're gonna let you have content. One of them might be an SBOM, which again isn't our responsibility, but we will verify, we will guarantee that that SBOM is accurately signed, possibly by the MyDB org. And another system can reliably read that information and make that policy. It's not our problem. Um, if the, it's determined that the MyDB build server 12 that derives from that key has been revoked, to the CR that we need to add, we need to make sure that that revo revocation could go in. So part of the system, I don't know where to put it yet, can know that, hey, that thing was signed by this key, which is now no longer valid. Um, as opposed to how policy managers make decisions on the data that's inside the payloads. I think, yeah, there's uh, a version control versus integrity of this thing, right, or this, the authenticity, authenticity of this thing. I'd go higher and say policy versus integrity. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're going to exactly. validate the integrity right. and not enforce the policy. Yeah, that's right. I, I do want to be careful here that um, that we're meeting the goals we have of making the system usable and also secure, like effectively secure enough in the default sort of cases. And I think maybe with the scenarios, we can look at and see this because I'm not exactly sure what we're planning to leave to policy here and declare out of scope. But if it's something like, um, you know, knowing what the valid version of, you know, this of like MySQL is like doing classical dependency management, I think that which, which maybe isn't what you're saying, but if that were what you're saying, then I'm a little worried that we're leaving sort of so much of the problem unsolved that the resulting system isn't, isn't going to provide, um, that, that we're effectively punting the security problems elsewhere, the policy engine. 
Well, what I, I all I'm saying is from a support <coughs> perspective is I don't think we can get into even knowing what a version is per se. Well, no, well I, know. I was I was thinking about this last week, and I think that because we there was a bunch of discussion at the last call about basically that we didn't that a lot of people didn't really care at all about tags and like the names in the registry because things could be arbitrarily moved around and it was not important. But I was thinking about this. Like the basic user case for a user building something, tagging it, and in, like wanting to make sure they're running the same thing as comes out on the end because they've put um, Justin's great app kind of version 46 in a good manifest file, and they really want to be sure that they're running the thing that they thought they think is by name. Cute. Well, it is the that's the fundamental interface and registry. Yeah. Um, and we can't make Justin's app developer create an S bomb, for example, to to persuade myself that it's my app that I just pushed to a registry. I, I like I right. I really want to actually be able to get some guarantee just from the basic workflows that we actually expect with a registry and an orchestrator and the kind of flow through there. So I think we've got to be careful that we're not. Like making, I mean, we don't want to rule out scenarios where people have complicated policies, but we also got to take into account like the basic expectations of a user. Um, and we, well, which is why I kind of think that we need to have a bit more thought about how mirroring works and what it needs to do and what it, what, 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 what things are left unchanged when you mirror things and what things are are changed and um, because it's basically if I if I don't if I can't really guarantee anything about my app by name when I when it comes out the other mm -hmm. end I'm literally going to be forced to put the chart two plus six hash in right and then we don't need signing but I'm also never going to be able to read anything on my manifest again and it doesn't correspond to the workflow that people actually like to use um, but it's a very simple thing I, I literally if I if I have the chart two plus six and everything I use, then um, I you know, the time really you talked about the usability also. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, so I think that um, so we, do, we do need to actually kind of yeah. understand this kind of what is the user's expectation about things and how can we extend these to work across the kinds of scenarios that we actually want to happen and that actually people use as well, like mirroring and moving things around yeah. and things which don't work now at all uh, either. But we need to kind of do it without requiring everyone to add an S bomb to all content, which is never going to happen. No, I agree. So I want to be really careful. We should absolutely have the the verifiable thing that we talked about without enforcing a policy to be part of our course now. Like we should not require an S bomb that we're not even taking a dependency on a specific one to meet our initial goal. I think the question that is a I mean, great one and, and, and is the name. Like, and this is actually why in the definition of the terms, I teased out artifact as a separate name, because I think the name of something, the MyDB uh, colon V2, let's just say, um, where I move that across a repo or a registry, is, I need to know that that's still the same thing. You're making a good argument that I shouldn't be able to, I should know it by its name. And separating the, the, the path, namespace path, we can debate which one we want to call because I don't really care. But the point is, is that I, I think you're trying to make, like we all agree that the path and the registry well, should not be part of the signature. We, 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 know that, we know that registries confuse location and content. Yeah. Right. Um, <clears throat> but, but conceptually, people do think of, uh, I think you have a mental model of some kind of canonical, canonical name, name or something, or or we need to be able to provide a way of them to, I mean, it could either be some sort of, I mean, it could be, I don't think it, it I don't think it's, um, I mean, if, you know, the Ubuntu official image is a thing that people have a mental model of. Yep. And we want to be able to have that in lots of places and people can be sure they're getting the same thing. And when it's referenced in the from statement, we want to make sure that it is still the Ubuntu. So I, for the person that, I, I don't know if anybody else was pushing with me, I was pushing back the most on 
having the re like having the repo or the artifact and the tag be renameable. I, I think I'm kind of pivoting back on that as long as the actual last node and the tag is the only thing we're saying. Well, well, I don't know if that's what we are saying. Is that's the thing? I think it's okay. more, I think it's, I don't agree with that at all. Which part? Making any part of the name not mutatable. Okay. Why? Uh, well, um, okay, then how do I know that my that I think we need some sort of notion of a canonical name that is divorced from the location. Yeah, we did that happen okay, which, yeah, which, which is which is different from saying that I take the existing image name, which today is the location. And you know, I definitely yeah. agree. I, I I think that um, I mean, my thinking was that, for example, um, say um, SQL Server would have a canonical layer of Microsoft.com slash um, Windows slash SQL Server or whatever, which would be unrelated to where you might get it from ACR um, in some region, which might have all sorts of different addresses. Um, but you would, um, but it would be the name that you would be validating. Yeah, I, I think we need two different things. We need one which is the location and one which is a, a name that you're validating. And we shouldn't try to use the same thing for both of them. So, okay, so I think we're talking about whether the name, and I just, I brought up the, the doc that we were kind of, I was trying to tease out some, some of these things. So in this case, I'm calling artifact being the last piece that would be the MySQL colon v2. Yeah, no, but that that's just a tiny namespace. It doesn't have. It's, it's a very. It's but it's the thing that allows me to move things because no, it's okay. name, that namespace is too small. So I was. In my that's box. effectively a one level tier global namespace, which is well, but it allows you to do this. I was trying to find the balance of what I put in that versus this larger conversation. So the problem is, here's what customers wind up doing. Where did I do that? Uh, here. I could take, like, here's what it, it's starting out. I have two teams. I have a dev brand, I have a dev namespace that has a red team and a blue team. And they've got web API and a batch processor. This team has got a web API and a queue manager. And then there's a staging environment in the same registry, and there's a prod environment in the same registry, and they're only de designated out by path. And whether it's two or three or n namespaces, which is just slashes or special characters, is not really important. They can do dashes as well. So the point that I'm making here is that these teams can move, like this dev team took their web image, and this is the thing that what I'm suggesting is we have a way to sign that piece. And when I move it, to the staging environment, the marketing group, and then it moves into prod, and then eventually moves into an archive location, that signature moved with it, and the name is the name. So I think what we're debating is, like, I want to make sure that everything to the left of it is not part of signature, so I can move them. That, that name is just too small for me. I mean, literally everyone calls that thing the same thing. Well, would, they be, mean, they, would they be signed with the same key? And maybe you're making an argument for what Sam was proposing is it's actually an element in the manifest. I, th I think it should be two separate things and not try to reuse the location to, to determine the name of it. You so what do you determine separate. location? The fully qualified domain name or the fully qualified name or? What, what is the image name today it doesn't have anything to do with the content of the image whatsoever. It, has, it only has anything to do with the location of it. So if you leave it that way, and then you add something new that has, this is a field which I'm putting whatever content into it that says, this is what I believe my canonical name is, and then I sign that with a key. You can say that I trust Sam's key, and whatever Sam's key says that this thing is, I'm going to validate that. Or you could say, I'm only going to trust Sam's key for things that, are, that Sam is identifying in a particular qualified namespace or something like that. How do you locate the object? I think the location is different from the, you locate the object with the, what we have the, as the image name today, which is 
What does validating the name give you, though? It's not just validating the name. I think he's saying the name is part of the value. I can look at that name and, and it's an immutable thing. Like that is, it, when I look, when I see the signature, the name, here we go. This is what I was looking for. I, I'm saying that the name is basically a claim that is signed with the signing key. Okay. And so you're able to validate that as part of the content when you're validating the signature. But that's already within the signature. It doesn't have anything to do with where you pull it from, right? Right. It doesn't have anything to do where you pull it from. It, it and if I wanted to rename this it's thing over just here. A field that you've signed. Right. And I've claimed that this is my name. Okay. So that would allow me to, it, for some people, they actually re tag their stuff. Dev staging and prod, I didn't put that example in here. So this will be 1.0 dash dev. Then it'll be renamed 1.0 dash prod. So that would, what Sam's proposing, would allow that. What Justin's suggesting is that name couldn't, if you re, you couldn't rename the tag. So I think it's just the flexibility of both. Yeah, I, I think what you're proposing basically is imposing a workflow on people. You're saying that only this workflow is the thing that's going to be supported, whereas the, as the existing tooling for how we deal with container images today does not enforce a particular workflow. Well, to be fair, the workflow is broken for something, so find a solution. Yeah. Uh, yep. So uh, I just wanted to say that. If we think that this, this like renaming and moving of things is part of what should be happening, then I think making a scenario that explains this and explains why you need this and what it does, at least for me, would yeah, be a lot clearer if we think it's important. Yeah. We, 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 we do think it's important. There is a scenario, but I don't think it's very clearly explained, especially for someone who's not familiar. I mean, I think that it, it's... Um, it, it it comes from what actually happens in practice um, because there are um, I mean roughly there are no well I guess when we started notary there was really only one registry um, and now there are a very large number of registries and most people um, use um, <coughs> multiple registries um, people have invented workflows around promotion and things which are maybe not very good arguably but they exist um it's like arguing the model we pose a bad design and two yeah, I mean, uh, vendors are, are but, but, um, way. But, but fundamentally people run registries locally in production as a pull through cache people run registries um on edge devices on submarines people run registries um <laughs> in every cloud region that they're running content because it's local to their their region so they don't pay exit fees. Um, uh, people run registries, separate registry for like GitHub Actions as its own registry and GitHub for, for when you're building stuff, but it may not be the registry used for production. So the, 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 the movement thing is comes from the fact that it, it's, a, it's very real and the naming issue has become a problem because um, you, you basically can't validate content between these things except by hash. Right, and and so uh, is this scenario no, four that that really covers this case? Because scenario, like like this, I, this I, idea I, of moving. I definitely agree. I definitely agree. It's not very well written if you're not familiar with. I even call it out more. I, I think it's too. Detailed and and to and not generic enough as a description of and it doesn't it doesn't kind of explain why people are doing this and what kind of things that what the expectations are either. I mean, I think I was going to try and just write a separate a document just <clears throat> explaining what the mirroring situation is and why it's kind of got that idea. I don't know. I just, I'm not sure what will be most useful, isn't it? Because I think it is it's definitely one of the most important driving requirements that's happened because of the change in how usage has changed over the last five years. Is the intent as it, uh, it goes from registry to registry to just have them re-sign? Is there what expectation no, no, is there for a nested signature or a re no, 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 you can't. You can't. You, you don't want to re-sign because you don't. 
like in some of these registries are not particularly trustworthy at all. Some of them are. Sorry, for those of you in the call. <laughs> so the, the classic problem is we ship Microsoft software. Right? We're a software company as well as a cloud. We want Windows SQL .NET and Dynamic CRM to be able to run in AWS. And it comes, but it should be run in your registry because it's closer to where your deployment is. As soon as somebody pulls it out of MCR and puts it in any other registry, we our own, the signatures are lost. So there's no verification. What am I going to force you to re-sign our content? Who are you to sign our content, right? What does that trust provide? Um, and in the IoT case, we have the same thing. Like we have certain customers that, you know, have these nested uh, secure environments. So they want to move their IoT image. And maybe they get it from us, maybe they get it from a third party. And as soon as they bring it into their environment, the signature doesn't mean anything anymore. Um, Problems so get like, screwed up yeah, along the line. Yeah. I would. The question I is, would argue this is a great. Sorry, go ahead, Justin. I think this is a great scenario to add because I would argue if we were if we were talking about design, which I think it's premature to do, I'd argue that you should keep the old signature and have an, a new signature for the new registry too. Whereas I think this this concept of of just checking the old one is fine too, but I think you actually get advantages. Like if you can have a design that does both, I think that gives you the best solution. So this is, well, I, I, I don't want to fight that battle now. I just want to say that. No, 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 I'm going to up tonight. Uh, you guys are kind of so I'm curious as to what, what, what advantages there might be. And yeah, so, so, so if you just have one or the other signature, then I think you have problems that you, you don't know if it's blessed by both parties, which is really what you want to know. And so, I don't like, know the, the, yeah, but, but, but uh, I, I'm also leery that we're kind of probably reaching close to the end of this meeting. At least I have to go in eight minutes and I don't want to, um, I don't want to derail it. I just want to say that I think that the way for us to move forward and have this discussion is probably by having a really clear scenario with it and then going through and then, you know, we can quibble about uh, what the advantages are to having both or just replacing one or leaving the old one and not having the new one or so on. So I do believe that six covers the scenario. Well, I think it just needs rewriting. Which, yeah. I mean, I think that is, I think, um, I think we should take it, I think we should take it go just rewriting me to, basically. Yeah, I, that's what the PR was about. Yeah, Give me yeah, some yeah, feedback yeah, on yeah. what we want to redo about it, because yeah, I, I think, think the scenario that, that Kapos is referring to is, like, we shouldn't, I think what we're, what Justin Cormack here is kind of reiterating is what I was suggesting is you shouldn't have to resign it just to know that it is still the same image from the, the artifact from that vendor. The question that whether I want to say I have a secondary signature that says just because it came from Microsoft doesn't mean I want it in my prod environment. The old version that they shipped last month, that one I'm perfectly fine with. I've tested it. I'm allowing that in production. The new one that just came out yesterday, I haven't run my tests on it yet. I don't trust it yet. So I trust that it came from Microsoft, but in this scenario six, one, and two, I talk about it until, uh, what was it, Acme Rockets or whatever it was, a test does the time signing, sorry, does the testing and then signs it specifically for the Acme Rockets product, mm -hmm. product environment, it's not allowed to be moved into it. So I think there's a test for both. Yeah, yeah I was kind of thinking along those lines, like the whole promotion scenario, build server goes and yeah. signs the image, goes to almost the staging area, gets scanned, does whatever else, then it's actually let to go. But the, the challenge is if you re-sign when, when it goes from that stage into prod, does it imply now that it's been re-verified, but not by this? If you go, you're intending to trust the build server, how is it that you can still infer that and it wasn't, you know, fast forward a couple of years or whatever, how can you infer or in other scenarios that that really wasn't modified in any way, shape or form if you're re-signing it? Oh, I am suggesting that it's an additional key. The first key isn't right. invalidated. Right. So you right. you could say I only trust things that have and, right? It has to be from Microsoft. Those are the key as trust and the Acme Rodic and prod. Um, so this way and. that the first signature is still valid because the content didn't change. I just put another stamp on top of it that says this signed content mm -hmm. is now also 
approved in my environment. Now, what gets a little interesting is when the SBOM does, there's some interesting SBOM scenarios where they do want to add some other metadata and they want to have that signed as well. And that's where I kind of think of the mm -hmm. SBOM stuff is good. Because the SBOMs have the concept of hierarchy. Yeah. So here's my SBOM, and then here's the SBOM from where it came from. They're both signatures, but those are separately signed things. I don't think we need that for the core scenario of what we're trying to do. Um, but if you need to know, hey, this test environment, who did what in that test environment? Was it tested with what binaries? Um, those, I think, but I, yeah, I think, we, I think we need to make this, yeah, clear. I think, let's clarify these yeah. with the more. I actually take back my tower, because in that case, there's actually another implied level of trust related to the additional activity that happened in that staging environment that really would necessitate another signature, because it's not oftentimes when you go into fraud, in the case of fraud, it's not just did it come from that filter, but did this workflow take place and was signed at the end of that too? But that's actually. But are you it suggesting is. it's just an integration test, or you're saying there's something else? Now? Like, I, I know. I guess I'm trying, trying to, to tease percent. out if there's like uh, the the nuance between like say taking other activity and there's an implied level of trust that comes with that in addition to the initial signing mm -hmm. versus simply moving something from one place to another. So they should be <clears throat> they should be divorced, right? Yeah. Like if I'm going to make an assertion, I need some key to make that assertion. So if I am saying that this has been tested, or if I want to change the name to something that should be trusted in policy, I need to sign whatever I'm putting in. Versus some developer just saying, oh, like I want to rename this to make it easier for you to understand. Mm -hmm. um, we're not necessarily validating that assertion. Yeah. Uh, no, but. Like if I but you can say that, right? meaning you can sign it, and that could be your attestation. The signature is that. But we don't. We shouldn't necessarily make it that if you're renaming it, it needs to generate a new signature, right? Like if I move. That was that was that was that was well, that's yeah, 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 right. 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 The location is different from yeah. location, file name, whatever we change, like shouldn't affect it. Yep. It's only the assertions that you make in the. Well, that we, well right. except that was the conversation that we had about like the actual user expectation is to some extent that. What you, because the registry is a a file system that you don't expect to modify its file names in the middle of use because it is designed to be <coughs> that even names are mostly immutable. But uh, generally, you do expect things to not be renamed, and that well, the current signature flow does. But I, that's what I was trying I mean, to tease out in the definition terms is. If we can say the thing at the end, the right is the name, I'm not suggesting we agree with them, so that was part of what I was trying to tease out, versus the path and registry, then we at least we can say this thing that wherever it flows is still signed. Whether we're signing, whether we're attesting to the actual name in the last element or it's a piece of metadata inside of the payload, there is a thing that can move and it's always signed. Um, is there some other way to verify besides the signature where this file comes from? Do you care where it came from? If you do, like, could you use some other mechanism is what I'm trying to get at. Because I don't think the signature is the right way to verify that because signatures are a method of assertion and validating those assertions. And location could or could not be an assertion. So mm -hmm. if you decide to set up some other mechanism. Well, no, we don't, yeah. yeah, we definitely don't want it to be location. Right. right. But, um, but potentially we want it to be name. But to your point, what, what is the name? Because yeah, everybody yeah, has well, web version one one. So what exact now maybe it's web one one, but the signature is from foo versus bar. Um, but to be fair, I think from a scenario point of view, maybe this I'm trying to figure out how do we transition from let's wrap up the scenario and move into how do we design some of this because I think there's some proposals on some of that. Um, I think the question that I'd love for us to kind of come to conclusion on, and then we just don't come to conclusion yet, we come back to this is, what is in a name? Like, what do we define is the name? And I tend to lead to what you're saying is that there's a way to put it outside of it, and I can enable workflows that I rename the tag, for instance. Um, I'm struggling with it because honestly, as far as our own naming at the end, if you like, I realized this when I wrote this blog post yesterday. One of the things we did with the Microsoft images 
was we used the, the bigger hierarchy to represent products. Where is those Windows images? Like, where did I put those? That was actually at the end. So our .NET and Windows images, as well as a lot of like SQL and some other products, we actually use, here it is. So .NET Core Runtime. Is Runtime V8, V3, is that, it, it, what I'm proposing right now is the last thing, the artifact name would be Runtime colon V3. I, what Runtime? Like we purposely use this .NET Core Runtime Structure. So and, and I'm not following my own. That's what structure. I was talking about about imposing a particular workflow. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. I'm, I'm, so that's why I'm struggling a little bit with like how where do we find the thing that I'm signing because I don't want to have to go back to digest. Like it should I should be able to look at it. Or you, can't even, about, you can't even retrieve anything from registry by digest. Was yeah. that the path? Was that the path? Yeah. Yeah. That's path. So, yeah. So, um, yeah. The the client the end of some registry we store those digests separately and you can move it around but you're right the Docker pull command does need to like I, if I move that same artifact between two repos the digest is still the same yeah but you have to know where it is before you yeah, yeah. I I don't think we're saying that at any one point when I repull it I have to provide the the path because that is where it is. And it's the same thing whether I have a binary, like I, I, I like to reference the old MSIs on a network share, like I need to know where I'm getting it from. At the end of the day, I don't really care that I got it from there. I want to know that, you know, office.msi is still the same office MSI or pick the thing that you're going to install on your machine you're worried about. Um, but it shouldn't really matter where I got it from. But to get it, I do need to know the path. It's just right now, the workflow combines those things. Like if I say npm get, I separately configure what NPM registry I get it from. Today, with the way the Docker flows are, I'm encompassing the entire path into it. And in fact, that's kind of what I put at the end here. I made some comments around, should the artifact reference include the registry? And I kind of said, it'd be nice to go back in time, but, or do a massive break and change. That's about as much as we can do. All right. Uh, you snuck out already. Do we want to take a break? Yeah. I think yeah. Justin was, other Justin was dropping off at 3.30 anyway. Mm -hmm. All right. Let me take a 10 minute break. We'll be back at 3.45 um, Pacific time. And let's put a note here. Right. I also have a conflict uh, in, in 15 minutes. I just wanted to point out that uh, Tushank and I are going to uh, work this week and try to come up with some context for CNAB uh, in the V2 discussion. We were going through uh, the proposal and design and uh, hope we can give some relevant uh, feedback and scenarios that we've encountered when talking about signatures in CNAB with customers. Excellent. Thanks, Radio. Okay, so let's uh, take a break. Steve, is there coffee? Yeah. I remember you saying the form is better than ours. <laughs> I'll show where the coffees are in the bathrooms, the two primary ones. So the trick here is, um, see that one too? That's, yeah, this too. The front part of these are fun bits.
Hey guys, sorry, I had to step away for a moment. Uh, is everyone taking a break? Yeah, quick, quick, quick. people are already taking a break. They can come back in five oh. minutes. Perfect, thank you. Hi, how have you been? I was in the dream. I've been running all over the place. I used to be on the 21st, 22nd floor. Yeah. Just, uh, I never at my desk. Yeah. 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 Of the car building is it's a little bit like the New York subway because some of the floors you have to go down to another floor to like transfer to get to another floor. And that's annoying. What happens when you have a high rise though? But, I mean, couldn't they just have all the elevators, like two banks, be going to all the floors? I don't know. Every high rise I've worked in has been like that with transferring floors. 
Yeah, I guess so. I mean, they try to, yeah. That is true. Damn it. <laughs> Damn that logic. <laughs> I think we should have the next one at uh, AWS again, because we've got mostly AWS people. <laughs> yeah, you know, just like, we've invaded. <laughs> yeah, Google is proxy. They stopped driving. People can Google. Yeah, I don't know what happened. They, were, they, um, they had their own solution. They had the uh, application. Yeah. I thought Omar had actually spoken with them somewhat recently, like a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Right. But, uh, That's why you lots of papers as a whole day. Inside your doc, you, when you say the tag signature, it has to be inside manifest. Hmm? Right in, in the doc here. Right? Yeah. The signature has to be inside the manifest, but it's not going really to be tagged. No, the signature is um, by reference. So the signature has a digest, and then it's another thing that you can go get. Oh, okay. yeah, so the signature is not so in the document, right? I yeah. So it's in another document. Yeah. But then if you, yeah. Have another signature, then the digest will change. The digest in the index would change, yeah. but not the digest in the manifest. But that's one of the things that we, when we get closer to deciding implementation things, we'll have to pay attention to. I think the one thing we just wanted to write up some different possible ways that it could be there. Mm -hmm. Not that any of these are a way that we actually should go and implement anything. Mm -hmm. I think the one thing that was kind of interesting with the threat model, uh, the last one with respect to notifications as well as the alerting, if you will, is just ensuring that the data is available in some way that it could be consumed by wherever this has been implemented, whatever, not whatever notification system they have, has the necessary details on the event so that, you know, the whole um, sequence of events can be maintained and can be reordered potentially. Maybe not, but <coughs> but just making sure all the data is exposed in a way that we can consume it in other types of systems that would be meant for like event tracking, notifications, etc. I'm totally confused by that. There was a line in here that talked that referred to like uh, yeah. Yeah, but that was that was a misunderstood line. Yeah, that was a misunderstanding. Okay. That was yeah. that was <laughs> The intent of it was really more just having it exposed in a consumable fashion that could be handed off to another system. Well, no, 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 just the intent was that, that you would be able to tell if you were using right. compromised content, yeah. not that you would detect. Actually, do the detection right. Well, oh, yeah, or yeah. how it had been compromised. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which yeah. would receive apparent. It would just, yeah, be apparent rather than. Right, right, right. Um, yeah. It would, I mean, which is kind of obvious. Right? Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> In this. Yeah. Okay. So, what's the difference between index and manifest list? Mm -hmm. Manifest list and index. Yeah. The manifest list and index are roughly the same thing. It's just manifest list is a soccer term. Yeah. And index is the OCA term. And I think the terminology has yeah, always been a bit confusing. I don't think, because I think it, it I don't, I mean, uh, yeah, I think, because um, Phil tool is called manifest tool. Phil's well, tool is called manifest tool, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think maybe the terminology is changing. I can't remember. Did it, did it change or did it, I don't know. Anyway, somehow, both terms were used. I don't think it was Docker, but there's one Docker particularly. Well, it, it, well the maybe. term in the OCI spec is index. And I don't know how that got no, there. I, I, don't know how I, don't, I don't know the history of why it's no, there. I just know that that's what it is there. Yeah. Index. And then in the, like in the Docker, re the Docker registry protocol, it's the uh, manifest list. Okay. Um, what else do we have on the agenda? I can't 
that we had on the original day. Yeah, so we had um, the definitions and terms, um, which were actually might be relatively interesting depending on how we're talking about naming. Um, and then we started getting some design discussions, which was led by the, so it did, so it, well, design discussions, period. Um, I'm already trying to jump into some conversation. So I think. Um, Who brought up the JLPT Keto card feature, which uh, I know I, 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 it was, I was traveling, but I know which PR. I know the PR, but who was that? I don't remember. Honestly, I don't remember. It was Trishank. No, it wasn't. It's um, someone possibly from IBM who was doing that, working on that PR. I don't know they're on the call. That's why I was. No, in, they're not on the call. Cause okay. I, I, cause I mentally can associate the person if I saw them. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, I was, to be fair, I was putting stuff in there that people brought yeah, up. Yeah, I wasn't necessarily yeah. sure if it was the right thing to talk about. Um, and I definitely wanted to get to. I, uh, yeah, I don't think it's the right thing to right now because I think sure. it's further down the road because it's quite specific. And um, I think from the use case point of view, we all know that we want to support remote uh, key services. Um, that's very much a requirement. That oh, that's, and that's what that so, summarizes. But we, I don't think that um, uh, we're going to. I actually don't think that we. I think that it's likely that we'll mandate transport for those. Okay. Because I think people are going to use that. Right. Um, but I think there is. Um, I mean, we've actually been. That we, um, it is a it is a useful thing to have a sensor as transport, and there um, we have uh, with Arm been working on this um, Partech project, which actually does have a transport for key signing and things, which is quite generic and prototype based, which could do with a which is a local transport, but could do with a GRPC remote transport. So. I would be we'll be putting just some notes here. I'm just trying to figure out where to summarize this. I'll, um, I can reply to it. Um, I can add to it. Just say that Justin's got. Just, well, let's, talk, let's talk about it in person with the person who put it Okay. I, I, don't not, not, I, can't remember who I don't think it's relevant for right now. Okay. Discussions because it's quite specific. All right. So. You're going to say something there? I was just going to talk. I, I think there was something you just said that. Um, maybe we should document this is that uh, key management so, like there, there's some there's some expectation right there there will be a variety of key management systems in place mm -hmm. and support for yeah well, the private keys I think I think we said we need the public keys the public keys are public. No, there's right. Right. So so the everywhere right, but we would store no, them and people no, get access um, <laughs> but, 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 um, I mean, the bit. I don't know. In terms of the what's in scope, we need to. I think probably write a what's in scope. You know, the scope to Under design stuff. stuff. Yeah, because I think that it. Um, uh, where keys are stored, and how they're, how you make signatures is not really in scope, but. Um, Usability aspects of key distribution are very much in scope. I.e., uh, how what do users do when they lose access to keys? What um, um, what like how how many keys do people have to ha have? How many keys do people have to trust? How do they how do people get hold of the public keys that they need to trust? Those kinds of questions are around scale because um, a lot of the usability issues around current notary around the fact that there are too many keys and it's difficult to right. um, for design reasons there are way too many keys. So I think but is there another way to it sounded as if you were about to specify a number like in response to that you were about to say the limit is five or you know but. That, no, no, no. That, that, that feels fraught with. No, no, no. I wasn't going to say that, no, but, but it's just going to be like. I mean, the the current notary situation is effectively you need a key for every, 
uh, you need to know the root key for every repo you want to access, i.e. for every piece of software you want to access, which is way too many keys. Yeah. Uh, there was a good question. Because because we're, because we're trust I mean, they were they were potentially to be written at the time, but because we didn't have any hierarchy, you could you can't even trust a Microsoft key. You have to trust the the uh, the or as in your example, oh, well, the key key key. for each one. But the real problem there was the the, 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 the chaining. Like the, the problem wasn't it was the fact that it was just hard to use. Right. If you have an sorry, I'm yeah. just trying awesome. to answer the question. Is this the right conversation we want to have? In the app? Good conversation. We, I think we started by saying we didn't want to talk about this thing. We want to talk about this thing. Hey, this is what we don't want to talk yeah. about. Yeah. Uh, we don't about want to, I would love to get a, at least a, a further conversation on the naming thing and what we're signing thing. Because um, I think that's a little bit of what you were got in your design conversation. There's another piece of the design proposal one where some of these elements are stored, which I think can potentially come later. But I think the really important part is what are we attesting to and what do we want to kind of guarantee? Now, I'm not arguing this thing, whether it's an annotation or a new named element, but what is in a name and what are we saying is the thing, what is it you're defining is signed and verifiable? I feel like that's the, the piece that's still left. Um, regardless of how we write the scenario to discuss, that's the, the gnarly one that's still left open. Um, sorry, still I to see that. No, no. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, sorry. It's, it's, it's a little hard to hear, so I don't know if I heard everything. This is Kieran on the phone. Um, it sounds like we're saying for the, the GRPC stuff that it's too, we're too early for that. We're more in the design stages, which sounds fair. Uh, I didn't hear everything that was stated. I just wanted to quickly voice in on that. I'm I know sorry. part of the concern. Sorry, I didn't realize you were on the line. I, I'm, I'm sorry, what was that? Well, I, Karen, was that your comment? It was my comment in the Slack. It's not my PR. Um, it's another company's yeah, PR. Okay. But um, the, the concern that comes from all of our company, there's a few, few of us companies uh, actually in on this. Um, the concern was a couple things, and it was more in the implementation. So one was that it was uh, it it was kind of built into Notary that Notary would create keys in software, uh, at least for some of the types of keys, um, as opposed uh, and, and it did I believe what was called like add key as opposed to actually creating the key. So even if we use the PKCS11 integration, and and don't quote me on which keys these were, but I believe only the root could be created. In the in the HSM and the rest were were not, um, and that was problematic. The other thing was the ability to use existing keys. You know, a lot of in the enterprises we end up having the administrative side create the keys, so we don't want necessarily the signing tool generating those keys on our behalf. So again, I know that's early. You know, we're probably not there yet, but that's really the voice. It doesn't have to be gRPC. Um, you know. Uh, Dave did a great job implementing that, but it doesn't have to be the gRPC implementation, but something that allows that flexibility for the keys in the back, the back end. Well, you know, a lot of our, our, our companies have proxies sitting in front of the HSMs, as I'm sure your companies do too. And so the ability to integrate with those um, uh, in an abstract manner would be great. I think we captured that in a scenario because it wasn't in one of the scenarios that I listed, I mean, that I read. Um, so adding another scenario for that because we see local signing or local keys, um, a PKCS through any kind of transport would potentially address that. And that's probably a design decision that we implement. Yeah, but I think if, if, if the requirements need more clarification around these things, just, I put a PR. Yeah, we want to, so I think we want to have a separate requirements doc, the same way we have a separate threat model. And I was going to capture things like the key management solutions. If we do need it, maybe have an HSM kind of solution that, that requirement. I don't know. It makes me nervous because I don't know how you flow hardware keys in a cloud. But um, well, I do. They used to, you've got an API for it in your cloud, um, and they've got one in their cloud too. I mean, it's do really? You do. Yeah. How do you do hardware? Okay. Um, but I think that um, really are hardware back keys. If there's an API to send the hardware key up. Yes. 
It doesn't just, it doesn't send you the key. No, it just sends the time in. Okay. Anyway, this is why you guys are here, and I'll focus on more of the scenarios. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, let's capture the crime, but I think yeah, the um, the question of what the APIs are is definitely out of scope at this, this point because yeah. um, we know that we're changing a bunch of the design decisions around how the actual service architecture is, and those are the bits where actually a lot of these decisions will make for that it's kind of going to be. Um. So one thing was that, like, this is the reason that I previously I put a comment in your request about the like talking about keys and having keys in a certain place, mm -hmm. and rather than rather than having that, if we could just say sign this, so that would make it more. Yeah, yeah definitely, that, definitely, that's the wording we should uh, have. Yeah, that would make it easier. Yeah, I mean, it's just, just we, be signing, and the the key doesn't have to be there for you to. Oh, I was <laughs> so I was trying to be explicitly saying that he does not have to be in the in, in, where the key comes from is in part of scope, but I almost I pivoted too far. It sounds mm -hmm. like okay. Um, yeah, but then again, just I I could be able to clarify wording or issues to clarify wording. Yeah. That's the thing to do. Just make sure that everything's captured. Okay. All right. So let's. Um, before we move on to this, I, there's, this, this could be a follow-up discussion as well. You mentioned something about the key hierarchy um, being sort of problematic. Um, should we have a conversation at a, and have this offline afterwards uh, about keys and certificates and how we envision them, like what the challenges were, we'd like to understand a little bit better. This PK management gets pretty gnarly, um, and I think there's trade-offs on both sides, but sticking to just keys also just increases your blast radius. Um, so um, I'd be curious to know what the challenges were and if there's scope for addressing that in this implementation. Yeah, I think we should have that conversation probably not today. But yeah, yeah. created a parking lot for, so we yeah. capture some of the things we want to get back yeah, to. Yeah, definitely. And um, I think not also partly because um, it kind of there's an interplay between naming and PKI and those kind of things. But if until we um, then we may have to iterate across, you know, between what we're doing with um, understanding the actual to trust and throw. I mean, they, you know, what we who. Can I was just asking, connect those two dots. So you were you were saying that. Naming the naming constructs, naming decision is closely related to the PK. It might be. Oh. Maybe. I mean, maybe or maybe not. I mean, I think some, you, somehow you've got to attach key to names, and we have to understand that. I mean, and but if we don't understand what names are. I think that's kind of the first thing before we're trying to. I'm sorry. And in this case, that we're talking about names of the container, not name of the not the identity of the signer. Those are separate. Yeah. No, but you're saying you're talking about name of the container. Well, they might. Have, that's the thing. They might be. Um, yeah. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. So probably a good pause point. Like, do we? Where do we want to go with this? Like, we. It seems like naming is a piece. Is there something else we want to discuss? Do we want to? Kind of figure out what we want to do about how we're signing a name, or where we want to pivot this conversation at this point. I'm I'm kind of curious if we have um, other other similar um, naming. Versus location things that we should be comparing against for how we do the naming because um, and also what um, what we think. I mean, it's a, you know, we've got this sort of um, I mean, if we had, if we were designing this thing from scratch, you know, I guess where would we including the registry? I mean, you, like, what what are you saying, design from scratch? Like, no, the, the, the naming thing. 
Yeah. The, the naming of containers, what would we actually, I mean, if you want to separate, if you want to separate location from content in a, in a, in a reasonable way, what, what other examples have we got to look at? I was playing this idea a little bit, and like the NPMs, like the package managers of the world, is an interesting one. But they have a great namespace, generally. And that was the thing I wrote. It's like the, the package managers aren't your end artifact. Like, isn't the, like they are a component you bring in, but there's a separation between the things that I want to pull in when I want them to be a certain place, including vector base images, you could argue, is part of that as well. But when I have the, one of the fundamental things, and we'll specifically talk about containers or any deployable artifact, is I wind up with a thing. I want to be able to move that thing in different, like I need to move it from a public place to a, to a private place. I need to be able to move it between environments and people moving between environments in different ways. And that's different than an NPM or any kind of package manager component that I pull into an app. Well, like, well, I couldn't really find no, no, package not, managers. I mean, you can set your Debian mirror to any location you want. And, you could. And you get your, I mean, so from the package manager point of view, it's very much location independent, but there is a global namespace for Debian and a separate global namespace for Ubuntu. There's a global namespace, there's also a set of keys. So Debian in particular yeah. has a Debian key ring, yeah. which is installed on a Debian system and is used to verify the packages that are installed yeah. from a valid Debian mirror. You can also add your own keys for additional repositories. Yeah. Like that. But yeah. yeah, there's a single global namespace and a single set of keys. And while it's true that you have different ones, but they're not as they're not as as fluid as a final thing that you're trying to manage. I mean, because, because we one of the things when we had Docker Trusted Registry, which is now covered up. Um, well, it's still well, part of the well, no, no, it doesn't, it doesn't belong to Docker anymore. No, I know, but it's and still it, part of. I, I mean, it's like the, and it's, um, but one of the things that one of the features we had discussed around mirroring was basically having. Um, you know, virtual host support on it so that you could just you could request docker.io slash library slash Ubuntu from a proxy. from not a proxy just directly from a registry which would support end space content talk to that a bit more so you you so I'm in an isolated environment so imagine, just imagine it's an HTTP server not a registry and right. it's just a virtual host and you just configure a virtual host for uh, docker.io on, on your registry server oh, so and, we can and, and respond to the content in it that it can respond to yeah. and you just change the client so that you can just say use this server for docker.io. Right. right. Are you talking about content being pulled through or are you talking about content being replaced? Hidden? What do you mean by, I mean, or, like, it, it could be either. You could either. Okay. It could either be a pull through cache, which um, I think we did have support for anyway. And no, I think really it was unique to DTR. Um, no, well, no, because normal registry has pull through. The open source registry has pull through cache support, but I need pull through cache. Support. But it only goes to Docker Docker Hub. Like I can't do a pull through cache to ACR or ECR. Cool. And you? I I remember having this conversation. We couldn't. Uh, anyway, but I'm. Um, but generally, yeah, but say, but you could actually, imagine you could just push content there and say this is docker.io slash library slash Ubuntu 10 in this registry. It's a virtual, it's a virtual. Well, what are we trying to, I mean, say, that, that yeah, trying to sounds like the old Red Hat pull request that got. No, 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 well, um, no, but I just, sorry, I just, but I just, so I'm just saying that this is like, um, I mean, this is one approach, yeah. but I'm not suggesting this is a good idea or anything, I, okay. I it, but I'm just saying it's one approach to try to separating out the naming it. So you basically make the naming separate from location in the way the virtual hosts do. Oh, but the well, name is still the name. You didn't really, yeah. all you did was redirect. You basically did a host entry in a, in a, in a weird way, in a, in a better way, more elegant. Well, you, you, you I mean, cause it's still the same unique name. It doesn't really help me when I do want to reference it as a separate location because I want it to come from. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't go. Yeah, it doesn't change. It doesn't change that case. Uh, 
unless your registry gives you a rare one redirect for that or something, because you've configured it to say. And then the other problem is just uh, uses the Windows case, you know, Windows images. It's just because a new version of a particular tag came out doesn't mean I want it. Like, I want to test it first. It's like the Windows software update service. You know, like <laughs> our laptops individually might get updates directly from Microsoft, but inside the enterprise, the enterprise controls that update. So I, you don't really want the pull-through updates in that case. Well, there's a little bit of pull-through. I'm sorry, just looking about naming. But even the I naming think. in that case, because like the, some of the things do get updatable tags because you want them to flow through, and other things are unique tags. So I, I guess I'm trying to understand what I'm just, like, well, for I'm just talking about mechanisms that separate naming from location, mm -hmm. given what, where we are there. Like, I'm just trying to find out, how, like, what, 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 what kind of things would people consider? To, what kind of changes would we consider to be potentially reasonable or unreasonable if we want to make these changes without? Um, I mean, so you I mean, your suggestion of basically having a name that's signed basically means that if I want to retrieve something, I have to, I now have to provide two names. Yes. Which is a big change to well, the user. What, what you have, have, you have how do you make the jump and you have the thing that you want to validate as two inputs? Yeah. One is where one is where you're getting the content, and the other one is this is the thing that I'm trying to validate. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's a big user change. It is. Yeah, what, so, I didn't make so I'm just trying to explore the kind of the kinds of changes we are prepared or not prepared to make and just. Yeah, I didn't quite get the leap that uh, the poll, the, the Docker poll equivalent changes. That's what I just heard you say, though. Well, I'm I'm not proposing anything in particular about like a workflow. I'm trying to keep workflow out of it, in that I don't want to force people to go into a particular way of naming things or a particular way of of how they're organizing their storage or anything like that. But if you want to say like I want to validate. I want. I want to retrieve it from some location, and then I'm expecting this to be my SQL 5.6. Then I need a way to say I expect this to be my SQL 5.6, and it's stored over there. And so then I get it, and I say this is the thing you want to validate. You know, something that that's there and does that validate or not? But that's uh, a. Yeah, um, it, it's a policy. Uh, yes. Yeah. So it's a policy configuration. So it's not necessarily something you're pulling into Docker pull to change your workflow. Um, but, it, 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 it might be. It is I mean, because of how Docker pull images, which is sort of sure the implementation of Docker pull could change. But when when you're configuring your policy, <coughs> configuring your trust store, that's a one-time action that says I trust Microsoft and I trust anything that's named MySQL, right? Um, are you specifically every time having to re-specify because the, the, the implementation that exists today would do a Docker pull based on the file name, that stays the same. It's really the policy you've configured that says this is what I trust, which is a separate action from Docker pull. Right? That's something you're doing. You 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 but then, so, so one, <coughs> one way that this could work is Docker, Docker pull goes and retrieves the image from whatever location you specify and then Basically, Docker inspect exposes the fields that were validated on pull, and so one of those could be the name that is embedded in the in the claim on the signature that says this is my SQL 5.6. And then outside of Docker, I can inspect that image and say, oh yes, Docker validated that that is the name that I expected it to be, and I can go ahead and launch a container from that. But you, but at some point, you had the way you said you have to express two elements. What do you do so somehow? You do somehow. Yeah. If if the I mean, name, there, there if is the name and the content, or sorry, if the, the the content and the location are two different things, which I'm asserting that they are, and you want to insert on the content, not just the location, you have to specify both. I mean, the other, I mean, there are ways of kind of hiding that. You can define where you want to get things yeah. from in a config file based on the mapping from their name, right. and then just pull them by name. Which, which is roughly how which it is a, roughly like, a, like a Debian software repository works. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. Um, it has sort of a templated way of, of I take the name that I expect and then I go find that based on where the, how the repository is configured in my app configuration files. Yeah. Yeah. Although Steve at least would like it to be more complicated and 
That's the thing, if you want to say, I mean, that'd be a great direction there. I never argue for more complicated. He wants to change the direction there, I should say. <laughs> effectively, whereas the, the kind of Debbie and Mirrors that they all have the same, they might start at a different base, but they all have the same direction there. Yes. You want to move your content to somewhere uh, in a different direction there with a different file name, yeah. which makes the config side of this, like expressing a config for how you want to do this very difficult. So it's easy, it would be easier just to specify both names because the config is, because in, in a config file is going to be really horrendous. Basically the existing registry distribution ecosystem has exposed location as a thing that people can customize. Like very detailed level of this is the this is the registry that I'm putting in, and inside that registry, this is the repository, and this is the AWS region, and and very specific of of where the location is, and so people have done that, and that's now part of their workflow. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the biggest we pushed against uh, reg sub registry permissions that's for a long time for a bunch of reasons, and it's been the highest requested feature that we've had. It's like they want repo level permissions for different teams share the same registry and different environments accessing the same registry. Um, so I don't know how to treat them as a, a flat namespace, so to speak, that it, it, you have to have another registry then to move it to another environment. Like just, just separating out the registry name, I think is probably, get, we're past that point. I don't know if we can do that again. Well, then, but, so if you take the case of Debian, Debian doesn't require a different registry name, uh, it requires registry name and base path, effectively, and then it appends everything onto that. Oh, so you're really just treating so the left and right and the, the, so the you right map, map. You could map, you could map docker.io slash library slash Ubuntu to um, ACR right. slash docker library slash or, 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 slash docker slash docker yeah, yeah. Li slash library slash or but does the Debian image like, itself also have slashes in it, or is it only? We're not talking about the Debian image. No, no, they, so I mean, they, they happen to have the equivalent. equivalent. They happen to have a well. It, the repo is a tree of files, yeah. The package names they have slashes, but the plus you get in the pack in the repo. Uh, pack, bit, package names don't have slashes, and it's a flat name space. And if you have multiple multiple repositories that supply the same Packaged name. It's not the point of that name space because Ubuntu and Debian are effectively different name spaces. They're not stored in the same places. No, exactly. They're more like different registries. Yeah. And, but they store the same. Exactly. It's like the left side that changes, yeah. But you don't ever, you, you don't need to mix them. You, you, really you bad. really should not mix them. <laughs> <laughs> but yet, in a, in a registry, <coughs> there's no real, in fact, we're going further to mix things. Mix, mix yeah, things what, so. what I was getting at is like, Assuming that you have a, an installation of Debian and you're trying to install some package in it, Debian goes and, and looks for that package in whatever repositories it's configured to look at, right. except all of them. And if it finds that in more than one, then it's going to apply some logic for how it picks them. For example, it's going to look for the highest version number that it sorts by. Okay. Right? And if it finds multiple that are the same, I don't actually know what it does. I suspect that it picks one randomly. Or it's in some priority order that it's in the index of when it's configured. Maybe. I don't, don't think they, yeah, I don't know. I mean, they're not to be, the design, the design well, tree mirrors, but they might have lag, so you, if you find something in one and not the other that's later, you should probably use that. Yeah, it's, that's but why it has version of Often resolution. people only use one mirror anyway, because, but it's, but yeah, it's complicated. So, yeah. maybe a scoping question is how much do we want to, potentially unravel, like we, we're basically saying we're going to start over with signatures in a registry. Are we willing to start over with how content is addressed in these various runtimes? I don't think we can change very much. I don't That's the thing. So, okay. But I think we, we can, I mean, we I mean, If we were going to tease out the separation of a registry and an artifact and make those two separate elements, which, if you look at most production systems, they make the registry an environment variable or some variable of some sort, and then everything to the, you know, whatever portion of what they think is to the right is also referenced separately. So 
it's not that existing workflows don't already do this, and some we're going to make a some, some, some do, some don't, and the right side of it isn't necessary. Like, I could have 15 different people that are all having something named web, right. and they're all different, right. and they are not the same. And if you say that they're all the same, then you're going to run. No, agree. That's why I was asking. Like, honestly, the way we treat ACR, there's no hierarchy to it. We treat Slash as just a special character. It's just eye candy that makes it look like you know it's a hierarchical namespace. But we don't. We're never. Well, never. Never. So never. Um, the idea isn't that something Slash and there's two below it that configuring up here would allow different, you know, inherited permissions. So I, there's nothing that says that special slash characters couldn't be added to things on the right side as well. And you have the, the left and the right, and as long as they glue together and still work, you know, there's nothing that says that that couldn't be a solution that we generalize. So it allows you to have artifact names that can have some amount of hierarchy to them. It's I, think again, think visual I think you're still conflating like the location with the, the name. And I'm I actually trying to come separate. Actually, it's exactly what I'm trying to say is there's a registry to the left, and then there's the artifact to the right. No, but that's yeah, but not. But people, that's you're saying that there's multiple things with the same parts to the right that are different. And and people use these things in very different ways. Yeah. One, one, of, one of the things it's like it's out of the box already. One of the things, one of the ways that I look at something for, as like a, a service owner is I don't really want to force a particular workflow on, on a customer, mm -hmm. right? If they have something that's working for them, I want to help them do that. So I don't want to force them to change the way that they're naming all of their images just to fit into like this is the only way that signing works. Well, also because we need people to actually use signing, and if, we, yeah. if you have to change your workflow right. to sign it, yep. then it's a it's a, Difficult from yeah, the you, you've introduced. But I am suggesting that I'm not. All, I'm not suggesting that they do change. I'm suggesting that there's a way to to glue them together so they don't procedurally change. Well, some of your workflow has to change because you do have to define who you trust, and you do have to define what name you trust. Right? Yeah, I mean, but you have to. You clearly, obviously, your workflow has to change because you have to change the. Yeah, you have to well, take a thing, yeah. To be fair, the workflow is changing because so people we, are asking for signatures, and there's not a good viable solution. Yeah, so, but, but, so, but yeah, so yes, so those workflows are going to have to change. So I guess so. I guess, I mean, well, unless we can come up with an ideal thing that just makes it work without any changes, which I think is unlikely. <laughs> but um, that, I mean, that, but that, the ideal would be, um, would be something, you know, would be something where you could configure something uh, that gave you at least a minimum set of guarantees without doing much. With as, as little change as possible, the right. really idea. I mean, we don't. We want to. Um, I mean, for, for example, one of the things that one of the things we were always intending to do, and for reasons having, it was difficult to do initially, was just make all Docker clients always check signatures on the official images mm -hmm. because that should be something we can configure without. Um, making any changes to anyone's workflow or whatever at, at all, because it's just like we're more or less in control of the client and the registry in this case, and we could make those things work. Um, I talked about them in my talk about the fact that there are 132 different signatures to project for that is really. Some of which are used for multiple engines and other things like that. Make it really itchy, and I don't. We've never actually um, done it, but that would be the kind of thing that, in principle, you could do without workflow changes. And I think that we want to have at least um, some benefit with with the smallest possible workflow changes. If you want more benefits, you might have to make more changes because, like, I mean, if you want complicated policy requirements, you're obviously going to have to configure your policy engine. We're not ever going to get around that. But you, if we can give people something for very little or even something for nothing, that's even better. So to me, it's a question of degree. And maybe this is a really bad analogy, but I'm going to try it anyway. Um, we have, 
different vehicles that take different fuel sources, right? And you've got gasoline cars, you've got diesel cars, you've got hybrids, you've got electric cars, but you drive them all pretty much the same way. And so even though there is something that's different about it, maybe you'd argue one might be better than the other, and I have to do something different with how I put fuel in, or do I go and charge it? Um, like the main part of like how do I drive it is the same. Right, and so that's kind of what I was getting towards is like I think considering the the name as an attribute and a signature, but there are other attributes we want to also consider, right? Like we want to look at version numbers, we want to look, want to look at sort of like when we're actually actually signed. Uh, so the signature attributes in some way um, need to be defined in a policy. And that policy needs to get validated without a change to the workflow of how containers are actually pulled and deployed, right? Or with the minimal changes as possible. Now, if just for name as an attribute, we're looking to sort of like see if there's some other way to address it, what about the other attributes we may want to validate, right? Like we're creating multiple different workflows for different attributes that might possibly come in. I think these should all be part of like, here's the policy set of attributes. Whenever the signature is validated, you check against those attributes for whatever's in the signature, and that workflow should stay the same. Because if you think about the reverse case of like, why am I validating a name? I'm looking to see that this name hasn't changed. Well, if you're looking at the file name, then, and you have a valid signature for some, something else. So for example, uh, if it's uh, MySQL versus sort of like Outlook from, my, my, from Microsoft, then you could just read him Outlook to MySQL, and all of a sudden that would pass the name check, right? So I don't know that the name itself is a way to validate an assertion, unless like you have all the other like uh, restrictions yeah. in place. Date stamps, no host name. Those are both I've seen. Like where they're like, hey, if this was signed by you know within two anything more than two days, for example, or five days ago, don't do it. It's not. It's a different thing, but at the same time, it's a validation. By, 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 by name, we can assign the name. Yeah. Right. So, so, so that, which is sort of, I don't know, we were kind of being explicit about that, but I mean, you were kind of explicit about that. And, but I mean, measuring V1 signs and so it's, um, um, and so I think that, yeah, by name, we didn't mean an arbitrary name you happen to find on the file system. It actually meant something that's validatable, but, um, it isn't a, isn't, is, um, I mean, because from the registry point of view, it's like, if, you know, you, you, you push something to the registry with a particular tag, you expect to be able to validate at the, at the end of when you're running it, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter what the name is, it's just, you want a global a unique identifier that specifically what? addresses that bag of bits. No, 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 it's not a web no, because otherwise you just use the hash. Yeah, right. You wouldn't care about mm -hmm. that. It's a human understandable identifier that people mm -hmm. have got used to, that they have to give things a name when they put them in the registry. That so means something to them, but doesn't mean anything to anyone else. This is why to me, like the set of attributes that you'd want to validate go into some sort of claim that ends up being signed. Yeah. And like as part of policy that you apply when you go and say this is an image that I want to pull, these are the attributes that I want to validate. I'm trying to so one I'm trying to figure out how to not get caught in this quadmar though. I feel like we're not gonna we're just spinning which is it's good to kind of mull on some of these things, but Part of what you mentioned a little bit was on like, what do we validate? And I was trying to capture that. I think there's a certain key set of elements that we definitely want to take, like who was the entity that saw, signed it? Like we need to know that it was Microsoft that signed it versus Microsoft that Justin over here has made up. Um, there's, uh, there's something about the name. Once we get beyond the name and the signing key, even in the version, honestly, I get a little nervous because what is the version? Is it an opaque string or is it a, you know, what uh, um, was it called? Dotted convention, I just drew a blank. Semba. Sem Sem right. Sem 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 right. Uh, right, no, I know, and it can't be for lots of reasons too, so that's why you didn't get caught up. So 
And then there's like, hey, there's a whole bunch of things that policies managers want to use, and they should work with an SBOM type of thing. I'm just going to say SBOM type of thing, but they purposely do <coughs> lowercase o to be more generic and not buy into a specific SBOM. Um, and what our scope is, we will make sure whatever SBOM they put in it, they can attest that it is still the SBOM that it was. Um, that's what I was hoping to kind of carve off what I think we can, this team can accomplish. I feel like we're struggling now. Just uh, I don't think we disagree. No, but I think that there's a difference between um, the minimum yeah. guarantees you can get from the smallest amount of work versus I want to set up a detailed policy framework that lets me customize um, right. all sorts of things about examining the S bomb and what I can do. But it's um, also a fairly valid use case, but there are different use cases for different audiences, and we need to be able to support both of them. And you have to get something out of the simple use case that at least gives you some guarantees, um, because otherwise, we're not going to approach any kind of universality, yeah. and we've got to give a whole set of things you can build great tooling on to do great things that we hope people will build a community around. You know, providing more complicated work. I mean, I think that maybe having some sort of claims in there leads you to that because you can get to the point where you say, "I'm going to validate the signature on this is was produced with the key that I trust." Mm -hmm. but not go and say, I actually want to go look at these attributes, and then I don't really have to change my workflow, I'm just doing docker pull, docker run. But if I want to actually go and, and validate some of the attributes, then I say, well, this is, you know, after I pull, I can go inspect and say, this is what I expected for the canonical name, this is what I expected for the version number that was signed in there, and if it's not matching, then maybe that's not something I trust. Or if I signed something in there, but it was signed by a different key, than the one that I trust. If, if you don't check anything except the key, then you've got, you know, kind of, um, someone can just do repair tax on you and give you small content and things like that. Yeah. So you, I think that's too little. What I was trying to capture is what do we think is the minimum viable thing that we want to attest to? Like, without bringing in OBA and S bonds and all these other things, like, you just get an out of the box registry with whatever version end of whatever we decide to call all this stuff when it's done. Well, what you, do you get? Well, if you look at signing in general across, uh, not just in um, uh, container space, but other things, so what you're really looking at is who signed it and when did they sign it, how long is the signature valid for, right? Mm -hmm. um, outside of that, everything else is really uh, customizable from different uh, for different engines. And so I think... And some identifiers of things. Sorry. Well, the identifier, the, the signing entity. Yeah, yeah. the signing entity. The signing entity, not, oh, okay, not okay. the content. Yeah. Right, right, right. So um, those are the three things that you typically validate across everything. And so I'm curious, like, beyond that, like, why is uh, the name or sort of like the version number, like, why are those part of the simple uh, validation use case? Yeah, I keep coming up to that same. Kind of positive. That's because of what's the value of the signature then if you can use the image digest? Well, because it's not human I mean, okay, uh, okay, okay, let's go back and say, okay, so say, yeah, I wouldn't disagree that that has some bad value. So if you say, for example, that will tell you, for example, that you are happy to install any software that Microsoft produces, however old or bad or good, or whether it's SQL Server or Windows or um, Minesweeper. I mean, so it gives you some, like, but you know that it's from your friends at Microsoft, so. Um, and you could, but it doesn't, so it's okay, but it doesn't give you, it doesn't give you anything other than that. Right. So the question is, is that, is that, um, I mean, like, yeah, I guess it's, um, do we want to, is that our base? Yeah, I guess the question is, is that the base at which we want to start? No, no. Is, does it um, match our threat model? Can we, can we produce a, something that fits with our threat model that 
will provide that and nothing and nothing about that. Is it um, it starts with that. Wherever it is, it can be assumption that can start And then can we incrementally add features on top of that? But or other projects could leverage the fact that things are signed. Such as Well, I mean I think that we would um We want to be able to demonstrate that, it, that again, that you can add features sure. and sure. get more guarantees on an incremental basis from that point of view. I mean, ultimately, I'd love for us so, to do. So I guess the question is, is, is that is that the minimum? Like this is what I'm hoping we will be able to demonstrate. It's just we're delivering the blue things, right? The, the things they yeah, but that doesn't tell you what you're guaranteeing through. Is it that process? So it doesn't answer Justin's question. So it doesn't doesn't tell you that doesn't answer the question of am I getting Windows or Minesweeper on my Kubernetes cluster? Um, um if, I mean I'll, you know, there's you know, the diagram doesn't specify what the question you're asking is. Is is, is your question am I getting anything from Microsoft's great selection of software running on my Kubernetes? Yeah. Am I getting um, what I so one of the things that we talked about was the balance of the trust and first use, which the first use might be a kind of really bad thing that has I, to be signed versus I, I can excite I, I, mean, I think that, that personally I think that first use was a it's I think it was a huge mistake in measure day one because I don't think that well no well sorry. The trust and first use thing is really part of it's with the thing that Docker Docker can come to trust because no tree supports other any kind of thing you want. But I think trust and first use in a cloud environment doesn't make any sense because everything's so ephemeral that almost every use can be first use. And so, Fair. so no, it's really it's very different from the systems in which first use is good, like SSH where you repeatedly connect to the same server. And hopefully oh, you have a process for doing it. So that goes from your say from your laptop, right, and, it, right. and first use, you know, you can have a first time thing, and then you can do it for you know potentially months at a time. And those kinds of that kind of model works well. But in cloud, like everything that spins up the FM world is right. never used anything before. So everything's first use. So I trust everything, and it's pointless. Well, but the the piece I think I have a scenario similar talks about it is I could also like my dev environment might be trust and first use. So my staging environment says, no, here's the, I have to pre-provision the things, the keys that I trust. So there's a flag that's set and some yet. And it's hard. Well, I mean, I, I, I I'm not sure. And like, if you're going to do trust and first use, you might as well just turn off. Okay. I think. To be honest, I don't, I literally don't think it gives you any security at all. Yeah. Why do you hold, what, what's the case to hold on to that? I thought that was low hanging fruit to get away from. To get away from trust and first use? I was trying to avoid, so there's there's a, it is signed versus it's not signed at all. And then it's, so it's not signed at all, I trust anything, I don't trust anything, I, I accept anything. Like develop I accept software. everything, yeah. Then there's, I will only accept things that are signed because at least there's some traceability of what this thing was. It's like and then there's, there's yeah, that's no data. Yeah, yeah it, it has no, it's, you don't know what the key is, it's meaningless, anyone can, Anyway, anyone can sign anything. Everything can be signed. The original Docker signing model had all images signed. Yeah. Because it generated a random key for all Docker and computers <coughs> and signed everything. But you had no idea what the keys were. But yeah, in this case, the idea was that the key key was literally everything was signed. Um, <laughs> so you have two models of doing that, right? One is you get the key from a trusted store, which is like, you know, like, hey, I trust Microsoft, I'm going to get whatever uh, public key Microsoft is giving me. Uh, the other would be that if you go down the PKI route of a search route, like you get, like you trust publicly, uh, public search to kind of go validate whoever the organization is. But somehow you do need to configure your trust store because yeah. otherwise you go back to the yeah. value of like, why are we trusting this in the first place? And that was why, that was the idea that there's, some sandbox you can play, but it gets tightened up along the way. And as it gets tightened up, um, you can ultimately discuss these are the only things that I trust. So yeah, it doesn't block no, I think, the, yeah. yeah. Deciding who you trust, I think, is something that we do need to come back to more. But it's like, I think there are, um, I think there's a bunch of usability questions around that. For example, there are lots of different kinds of like Microsoft is straightforward. You, they, they have places where you can 
reasonably get their public keys from versus there are um, like millions of users of containers who you don't really know where you can get their public keys from. And for example, we might want to support registries having a delegation mechanism where they sort of give people keys that they sign, for example. I mean, like for, for billions of users on. I'm thinking the marketplace here. I'm going to go to a, these marketplaces, like Byte Hub, um, or the Azure Marketplace, or Amazon Marketplace, and vendors are going to put content out there. Yeah. And I want to be able to get that. I shouldn't have to, every time somebody wants to use something like company or my small startup, I shouldn't have to go pre provision something. That's, that was the idea that the trust and first use would actually be useful there is I can get stuff from the marketplace, I get the key, I trust, maybe as I'm trusting that marketplace as a location. Um, but you want to do that, in, uh, you don't want to do it on first use, you actually want to have an easy way to put that in your cube config, yeah. which is, um, which is a, you know, a nice um, validatable integration that you can see what key it was you trusted and, mm -hmm. and continue to validate that later and, and, and I, deal with key rotation. You definitely don't want that to be first use because you need to be able to audit where you got the key from. And yeah. I was thinking the key is the identity that I at least have some traceability. Like the thing that I got on my machine, I actually know it came from Foo Entity. Now, whether I trust Foo Entity or not is a different question. You but don't all know that it came from Foo Entity. Right. You, you know, know that Foo Entity is fine. No. You know, that, you know that there is a signature that was created by that key. And that's yeah. all of the information you know. And whether or not you trust that key tells you, like, well, I trust that this key is who entity. But there's nothing about the key itself that tells you anything about the identity. Well, I, 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 can, I can generate, really I can generate a key. key that does have that. Like, that was part of the naming stuff that you had that I was thinking about. No, you can't, about. because I can generate a key that says, I am Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And then if you install that, then now you trust me to be Microsoft, even though I'm not Microsoft. Not first use. It's not about first use, it's about like what's in the trust store. Like this is a key that you you are you have some me mechanism to say, I trust this key. Mm -hmm. Like you need a root configured somehow. Like either you're getting keys from every organization or you're getting a root from a public CA and that CA is signing uh same sort yeah. of thing from I was thinking along the whitelist blacklist kind of model is like, you know, until depending on the environment you know, like there will be a set of keys that there will be a set of entities that eventually get, you know, kind of like the scanners. The scanners know if they see this thing, like I'm not going to allow it. If I see a set of keys that I don't trust, a set of signatures that I don't trust, a certain set of keys, then I know to block those. Um, but in some environment, I'm going to allow most things unless they're explicitly blocked. And they're blocked by probably the vulnerability scanners that I protect. You, you can't can block this key. I mean, never. Well, you're you're basically blocking known content, and when they go off and spawn spawn another one, then they have to get that new thing out in distribution again. So there's not really any value in it, because you can just go generate a new key. Then you can just go generate a new key. But are they pushing them into the ecosystems as fast as I can block them? Like there's got to be. Well, I mean, I can set up the service, keep getting it over and over again. No, they would, they don't pay you. <laughs> Quite a bit. All right. What is the base of which we want to stand on? I feel like we're on this big quicksand pond. But not I think there's a. Is there is there not a, just a fundamental question? It sounds like trust store is a good replacement. The need and so there is again to the degree of do we how much operational change we're willing to take. Configuring trust a uh, trust store seems like a really reasonable. I mean, you have to, right, you have to do something to make it better. Again, trust on first use sounds pretty terrible in, in the cloud space. So I think that's a that's the question. It's an interesting thing is Docker Hub now become one of the trust stores that I can reference that things that get as you call them today certified actually go through something that says okay to get into this this trust store, then you have to be an identifiable person. You have to give the equivalent of your passport so we know who you are. Or well, customers can yeah. have the ability to do that. I think the answer is that no, no, you're always relying on. No, no registries do not want to become CAs. No. Yeah. Uh -oh. I don't think. I mean, I think that's. I think Sorry. that's like you. All the people, all the people in the room. You want to become a CA? Um, as as 
the registry? I mean, you already, I think I would you already have a customer to you already have from the CA for their entity, but I wouldn't want to, and MCR might have to be the CA for its Microsoft software. Now we're being yeah, yeah, that's, not a yeah. that's not what a CA is. Yeah. Yeah. So there are places where people will want to be CAs. So if um, uh, there, I think part of it also does go into like the PKI discussion. You want to have this kind of like links in with part of that. But if, for example, um, Docker might <coughs> want to be a CA and say like we're going to about if, if you're if you're asserting anything from from for your repository beyond like here's a repository containers you can get from mm -hmm. if you're trying to say like we've scanned all these containers or we've established trust for all these publishers right then potentially but the CA's role is really more to validate whoever's coming in and that could be a public CA there's no reason so to who's hide. coming in or the content that's coming in. The, the who, not the content, the who is signing, right? Okay. And you have some kind of validation there because signing is an assertion of liability in a way, right? So if I get something <coughs> that causes an issue and it's signed by Microsoft, then I know to go say, hey, how right. did this get signed by you, right? Um, and so you have some, uh, like the, the way code signing certificates that are issued, you have either organizational validation or extended validation, which are a mess. Um, and there are sort of like, there is work going on in the code signing forum to kind of see how to kind of go to address that. But this goes back to like, what do we want to identify? If we're trying to identify organizations, which is one use case, you do have to go down the route of OB to a CA. But if you're also looking at saying sort of like, I want to trust this user that has published to this repository, then for that, that repository will need some way of setting up a CA that allows that. Will all repositories want to do that? Probably not, but some may, right? And I think that's, and if you look at all the internal use cases as well, so for example, if I and Amazon decide that I want all my um, developers that are sort of like publishing uh, containers into my internal repositories to sign them, I'll probably have an internal CA that's then issuing keys up to each individual one. So, or multiple the CA, of them too. Yes. Um, Especially against largely multinational, different organizations or MAs. Even in specific verticals, they're, they're passing stuff back and forth. Mm -hmm. They need to be able to have, like, to trust another entity. That's nice to be a private CA as well. Right. So we may have private CAs, public CAs. I don't think we want to tie them with repositories, but they sh yeah. we'll need to think through what are the scenarios of what identities we want to establish to really go back and see what the CAs would look like. Yeah. And, yeah. and then there's also, I think, the question of with those scenarios, when and how do you actually want to validate this? Is this something that you, at the point at which you're about to deploy into Cube, do you want to um, do the validation of um, is this Blackface Medline uh, Department B, <laughs> or do you want to actually uh, do that earlier in the process and just sign as something validated there and that give the again have a um, you know Kubernetes just has a I trust I trust this stuff that has that comes from fraud and signature and fraud doesn't isn't isn't a um, isn't black size myth fine it's a, like it's just a key that I use but this is okay because it's fraud because it's been through this process kind of Thing. So it's going to be a question of where where do we want this? Which of these checks are um, essential to do when, and does it or, or which ones do we want to move around? Do we want do we want to require ability to do things in various places or not? And do we what and what do the simple workflows look like? And do we still you know do we support? Where do we support? Where, you know, where do we want? Where? Do, how much choice do we want to give users about where they can enforce policy? For example, I need your reaction to that. So you've got to provide pretty flexible. Like you, you can't account for every, you know, small enterprise, small customer case versus very large case where they they are managing their own team. They were multinational. And it's got to be flexible yeah. enough to support both. Yeah, and I think that's just, why this whole that, that, that statement that I thought he was about to kind of land on was, um, yeah, if you, you have to be able to have some control over your own destiny as an enterprise, I want to be able to, with a, with an assertion and arguably a change, 
I know better. And so I'll, I'll accept some things as trustable, but there's a security organization there that's going to say, I trust these keys. And therefore, and for these reasons, and, uh, and that seems to be missing. Right. I mean, I guess, you know, these are the things we have to recapture in the requirements, exactly what these, these kinds of non, the things that we do not want to constrain and things that we... Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and maybe it's or just the debate is, does it need to be that, I mean, one, there's clearly the case of, uh, uh, they, it's complicated flows, but how flexible does it need to be? Is I think where you were, you were just trying to go. Well, I mean, yeah, my question was like, could we say that complex flows need to be encapsulated in a simpler flow, for example, mm -hmm. for example, that making a complex decision and then just putting a signature saying that policy was, that complicated set of policies and processes was part of that's encapsulate that in a simpler flow for that matches the simple flow, or do we need to support um, all the complexity in any potentially in any location, for example? Those are, that's a kind of question about where we need to, like not about what we need to provide, but where we need to provide it. Yeah, that's what I mean. We need to say that now. Uh, you don't need to. So when you're talking about where, what, what are the different places that it could happen? Um, that's not apparent to me. So is that with the identity? Problem? I mean, there's, there's, yes. I mean, there's generally a workflow from where things happen between build and prod that maybe involve um, any set of steps like. I mean, a lot of people do. A lot of people want. I mean, one of the things that was actually very noticeable about Nature really One is that even though this is not what it, the guarantees it provided, people wanted to use signatures as work as workflow steps to say, or they or they thought that that's how what the model would be Nature had implemented did. So they wanted to be able to say. I want my legal department, like I want security to sign this off to say it's good to go into prod. I want um, this to sign off saying it's run through CI. Now, so these, these are kind of, um, and therefore you could also have that to say, and I want it to come from one of our validated suppliers who are listed in this 468 page document of which says which Microsoft products were allowed to use because they come under the, um, you know, the uh, Purchase mm -hmm. list, yeah. say, um, and we definitely don't want these Oracle products because we're not paying them any more money. Um, <laughs> um, um, and and so those were it was it is the kind of processes that people want to implement. That how you implement those is whether you do that. I mean, there's lots of ways you can implement those with signatures. I think there's a couple of them, like a hierarchy of how big you are kind of thing, right? There's the Microsofts and Oracles and maybe Adobe's kind of thing. Like they want to make sure that they can have some kind of certification so this is the software that we produce and that should be traceable all the way through. Then there's the smaller vendors that like, hey, I'm not going to stand up whatever that monstrous infrastructure is, but because I make my stuff available on the AWS marketplace or the Docker Hub or some like they provide some signature solution that says, hey, this is that vendor, and they help to make sure it's somewhat stamped with, you know, the WASI bot, whatever. And then the enterprises, mm -hmm. they definitely don't understand that that stuff, and we as registry operators provide them that service that we can say, hey, we will help you sign your things through that workflow. Um, so I think it's, uh, there's a, hierarchy there of if you're big enough you can stand it up and if you're not big enough you, there's still somebody that will play you into that space and give you that same kind of validation. Um, right but when I'm thinking about where right I'm not thinking about um, which environment I'm thinking more from the perspective of like I'm doing a docker pull and a what's the what's after that mm -hmm. after you pull it right. docker one right the environment that the Docker pull and the Docker run is set up, like you can configure whatever trust policy you want for that. Mm -hmm. So if it's in my uh, developer environment, I might say just, hey, only trust 
uh, my internal keys plus any public key, and that's the only check I put on there. And then in my prod systems, I may have stricter rules in place of like I make sure that this thing was signed by a build key. But from a configuration, from a Docker workflow perspective, it's still all uh, Docker pull, Docker run, and then the validation is whatever policies are validated. The keys are plugged in, they're yeah. allowed or not allowed, yeah. And I would have to go in and configure each of one of my environments differently based on whatever I wanted to restrict. So from a designer implementation perspective, I don't know that we need to build for all of that into the workflow. It should really be configurable in the policy engine. As long as we enable well, the okay, information. Okay, the question is, do you, um, what, do you, maybe it just comes down to, do you want the policy engine to, um, at the point at which you're doing Docker pull, just have just to be a list of signatures, or do you want it to um, be a policy that, say, inspects inside S bombs and looks up things in your corporate allowed software? That's a choice. You have a default but, that says it only supports keys, then you can plug in OPA that says, I'm going to look you Or do you want, but if you, or, do you, or do we actually force you to basically, if you have an open policy, make that open policy just be something that signs something that you then trust the key of? I guess. I think maybe this question doesn't, maybe it doesn't matter. Yeah. But I think we'd have to go through the scenarios to understand it because the basic use case can allow you to do anything you want to, right? Like if I created separate keys for my build machine, separate keys for my desk, technically I could just check the signatures and go through it, right? Um, I could also go through a uh, S bomb to kind of see a kind of a test, or I could even have certain attributes that can get packed into the signature. Um, the, the benefit of, like, I think, like having signature attributes is the S form itself could be a signature attribute. And then you can have other things that kind of like uh, validate the signature base. The problem is that there's some extensibility there. Mm -hmm. And then you let sort of like uh, whoever's setting up the environment decide how far down the weeds they want to go. Um, wait a minute, what do you mean by the S form itself being a signature attribute? So, when we are signing and saying sort of like, you know, it's a, the signature attributes essentially become like key pairs, right? So if you have something that says uh, SBOM and then this is the SBOM file or whatever it's that we're signing and attesting to, they can then compare that to whatever um, that uh, SBOM should contain, like list in your configuration. I think for architectural re registries, index type reason, that's, we can't actually do that. Because the SBOM is the yeah. megabytes of or gigabytes of stuff that you would want to just refer to by a hash and therefore need to be a separate registry object. Yeah, so well, I think in this way it would be a separate the, object. You put the hash as the signature attribute. Yeah, but you so might, then you might as well just start a manifest that lists the SBOM. Well, are, we, are we saying that these are coming Because the, the SBOM hash doesn't give you any anything you can make a policy decision over. Right. So it's not very useful as an attribute. You have it's to parse the content, content to make any which basically out. means that you might as well just have it as part of the content, so it's just part of the input. Well, then you're making this bet on a particular response. I'm, 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 missing, I'm missing what you're saying. If you want to make a policy decision based on the S bar, yeah. you've got to parse it. Yes. Um, you, which makes it rather more complicated than just a set of key value pairs in a for, well, for an S bomb is a large yes. key value pair. It's a graph of key value pairs, it's but it's, it's, it's a larger scenario. It's a, it's and and, and that, that one yeah. gets down into the how far in the weeds do you want to go question. Yeah, but I mean, I, 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 I think you could have a, a signature attribute. It's part of the con It's effectively a reference from the concept yes. that you can, you basically have to parse the content and pull it out and just do things with it. And these are things that you almost, I, mean, I think that you almost certainly don't want to do on your at the last point when you're deciding whether to run something on your kid cutter. Probably not. And so that's probably. Oh, so you're doing a pre-validation. Yeah, you want to do a pre-validation. Yeah. In fact, I even talk if you look at. But, but whereas the other signature attributes, I think, uh, like when was assigned, um, you know what? Um, maybe, you know, I, I mean, one of the examples that's come up is like. Um, uh, things like your security department signing off that it's okay to run this with vulnerabilities for the next 14 days or something. It's like an it's an override on something else, some other information.
question you might have, or um, you know, it's like this is this has top secret security clearance, so it will fit on your um, your, your multi level system, or you know, there's those types of attributes that you can make a a sane decision at runtime time about. Mm -hmm. I think a, a sane attribute, but it's yeah, I just don't think the S bomb and all the stuff it contains is the same attribute. Right, but I mean the signature attributes, which ones are picked at, at pool versus which ones are valued at run, right? Like it depends, right? Like it can be anything. Right? Well, there is only one. I mean, there is a well, pool and runners are effectively the same thing. Today it's well, just so. on pool. There is yeah. no distinction yeah. between pool and run. But yeah, but I mean, but that's the. Oh, did you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, sure. But I mean, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, in principle, yes, pool and run could make different decisions because. Um, it might be that one user is allowed to run top secret content and the other user is not allowed to run top secret content, but they can both pull out because it's encrypted or whatever it might be. Yeah, so like the difference between pull and run is more about where the validation will happen. Like I can pull something validated, but I can't run it. Like I can download all kinds of shit. Well, there's also, I mean, then there's also the power and PK system issues about the fact that once you pull something, anyone can run it. But, I mean, the way I might look at it is I have a different set of criteria for importing some content into my registry and then I re-sign something with a key after I've imported it and validated whatever I want on there and then when I'm going to actually pull and run that in my cluster, I'm only looking for the key that says, hey, I imported this and it went through my validation. Yeah, yeah that's completely. That's the kind of workload mm -hmm. that yeah. people are doing. And I think that may be what we was talking about as well. On yeah, with re-signing and registries, which is, again is a well. The the issue I have with that is like, is the registry the signer? But that's a well, yeah, slightly exactly. different question. Which is, but I mean, yeah, yeah. definitely a, an issue because I mean, um, I think in general, no public registry will want to just sign everything because it just everything can be put into public register therefore you can get anything signed so what's the meaning of it yes. um but a private user might have that you might or you might have some sort of integrated process where it happens for you yeah so, but then, again that's kind of what yeah work like yeah. i mean as long as you have the ability to sign a container right like anyone that wants to sign it before they put it in their repository can go create a process to do that yeah and like especially if we're doing vulnerability scanning, we're not just necessarily pulling into the repo and expect it to get signed. We're doing this scanning, signing off on it, and then putting it in the repo. Right. Well, again, it might be the you might put it in the repo. And it gets scanned a bit later. Um, and maybe it gets scanned weekly for vulnerabilities in the repo, and you sign it for the week after you scanned it for yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, there is some action I take before I sign it, and so I, I'm. I'm I'm, I'm thinking that like having additional workflows for those processes doesn't really impact the workflow as it exists today, right? From the perspective of like, I want to be able to pull this and run this, that's where I look at more sort of like how are we impacting that workflow? Because that's the one that everyone's used to and that's the one we probably don't want to have the least friction in. How deep do we want our core scenario to go versus what we enable? If if something is like in the most secure environment, I will only accept things that have a certain keys. You know, so many things that were signed with certain keys are allowed. Period. Like I don't even want the Microsoft stuff unless I additionally verify that that Microsoft stuff works in my environment. I may not allow it to come into my verification environment unless it came from a set of vendors that I trust, but it won't go past my production environment unless it's signed with my oxy uh, the name of the company was Goico. Over there, uh, the Glyco company. Um, and I think that that is like the core. And then the fact that we can sign these other things, like test bombs, which yes, can be hugely large, that in what is it, step three there, that I'm looking at the S bombs and deciding what goes to number five is the, is the running environment. The running environment, all it cares is that it's got a signature of a certain set of keys. Somebody already determined that. In fact, that case is it has to be signed by the Glyco keys. And it got there because some larger process looked at the S bomb, found that it was built in these types of ways, and allowed it to go through. Um, 
So I'm just I'm trying to figure out how do we scope what we think is the I hate the term minimal viable product, but you know the core scenario versus what we enable an ecosystem to build on. Okay. Yeah, I mean I think we have to. We actually have. I mean we need to enumerate some really simple scenarios for simple users and some really complicated ones for complicated users. So we've got them written down. Okay. Um, because otherwise it's just like because they because from the UX point of view it matters that the simple ones are simple yep. um, and the complex ones the UX matters less anyway. So they can be enabled. The complex, be the complex yeah, they're enabled, they're enabled, but they can be complex because people are prepared to invest engineering effort into building them out correctly and testing them and all the other things you have to do. To, but it has to be robust enough to be able to support them. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, it's just a toy. Okay. So I see it is five. Um, what what are where are we at as far as time frame? I'm not sure if you were packing up. I'm just trying no, to. No, I need it. juice. Okay. I'm I'm trying to keep notes. I'm not going anywhere. Okay. I think that we had three methods. I think this is this conversation was great, but so um, outside in because containers is not my space, right? But it sounded as if we have at least three critical questions that hadn't really been answered, right? And so tell me if I'm close. Um, did we divorce naming from signing? Why not? That was a question. No, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, right. Just kind of like you know, it's an open issue. It's an open issue in the context of like, um, and it sounds like I, I thought we were really close for me to grok that a little bit clearer, uh, clearly. Uh, and then this notion of um, I like this as going back to the run poll question, right? Is there an opportunity there um, for validation? Uh, Validate then run. Is that a better way to say it? Um, it feels like an open question to me. And then there was this tofu versus trust. You know, th this notion of taking responsibility in the context of what you trust as an organization, your size is irrespective, right? The size of your organization, th that's up to you. And the amount of time you invest into constraining your trust model to the yeah. thing that make, make sense is a function of who you are as an organization, who are we to impose that? I mean, we need to simply enable it. And so the TOFU versus trust model, I mean, um, uh, trust configuration by customer, or right? were the three critical things, outstanding questions that I thought we had. Did we land on where we are with um, what the minimum verifiable, yeah. Aspect, or did we kind of come to some kind of conclusion there, or is that kind of just revolving still back around we, the whole we, naming and deciding part? part of thing. So I think yeah. we came, we, we did come up with a, a straw man about what the minimum with potentially was, which was just trust Microsoft, for example, and without any. Um, Trust of the service set of keys. Is what I don't know if we've named it on that. Like, yeah. talked about, like, well, I think that's a, there would be a potential of, like, that would be, like, we, that we couldn't think of anything that, that, that was left from that. Yes. Whether that was sufficient, but it's yeah. kind of it, truly minimal. Yeah, it's truly minimal. But I mean, it's like, the, 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 the sort of the thing, but, the, but I mean, it, I think that which comes to the question of what, I mean, uh, let's, Fill in the threat model and make sure that we have the right, the ability to answer questions about minimal proposals, or um, you know, and what 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 user expectations are about what they're getting. Because I think we, again, one of the one of the problems with V one has been that the what we delivered from a general point of view and what users thought they were getting were way different. Because users, for example, thought that they were being provided with a method of doing this workflow type thing, which literally didn't, it wasn't the case. And like, yeah, for example, GDPR, you, would well, if you had a workflow, you would resign it and everything. Well, as you, as you know, every time you, well, partly because they were, it's a whole interesting mix of things. So people 
thought the signatures were for workflows and they thought the moving things was also how you did workflows so, so that when you were moving from one place to another. But then, it meant, which for a start meant it was never going to work with the signatures and so move with the object in the first place. But, but, you, but have to, you signed them again for the next stage of the workflow? No. Well, they wanted to, I mean, is that the way I read them? I mean, there was, there was lots of confusion about what they were. People just really, I mean, one of the things we need as an outcome is a clear description for everyone about what, what guarantees they're getting mm -hmm. and what they have to do to get these guarantees. And if, it, if there's a hierarchy of things you can do, then like level one, level two, level three, or whatever mm -hmm. it is, then we write this down so that it's comprehensible and, and also what we're not giving them because People, I mean, people find security really complicated, and people have. It, it turns out that I think that people have a mental model of what signing is, which probably everyone is just talking about different mental models, and it's like, and it's not quite clear exactly where it comes from. But then they kind of just assume it does what they want because they're looking, they're looking for a solution, and it's like, and so I mean, so part of the process of like going through. The what people want is that we can actually give them an answer like yes they let if you want this um but i think there will be um multiple um you know multiple things that people can do from that are more complicated that give them more things or whatever but i mean i think that just explaining in clear language what you're getting and what you're not getting is important um Because, yeah, because I think that there is this, 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 this big communication issue as to you know, what exactly what that is. I think the way to do or to eliminate this confusion is to define like what we are going to sign. I think the first item there should be more on like what do we sign, right? In the case of Notary V1, what we signed was a tag to digest mapping, right? And that because of that, Notary V1 has this this behavior, right? If we sign something else in Notary V2, we will have a different behavior, right? So if we can clearly identify and define what we sign, then we, we can then, users can understand this is what this implementation gives me, right? Well, do we um, even before? Well, I think, they, I, well, I think that's a starting point, obviously, but I think you need to explain even more than that, than just that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, we maybe need a more exhaustive list of scenarios than what we currently have and decide which one of those are minimal versus which one of those are extensible. Um, and we want to provide more complicated workflows around. Um, and I think that is that an action item we want to take that by the next meeting we have that uh, we've added in all our thoughts on what additional scenarios we want in there and then we vote or go through them. I mean, we may decide that some of them are already the same. Um, sure. But I think, um, I think just maybe, yeah, I, I think that multiple people writing them down just in different words mm -hmm. is probably helpful. I mean, I can try and write down all the things that users asked for, complained about, mm -hmm. said they want to do over the years. Um, to me, kind of thing. Uh, so it's kind of, um, and we could document the general, hey, we, like the signing requests that we've heard and entertained broadly, container specific or not, right? And you guys could say that fits or that's hog shit and it doesn't make any sense for containers, right? But we could at least populate scenarios more thoroughly and then collapse them. Yeah, I think, I think collapsing them should be relatively straightforward probably. Yeah. Yeah. Too many and rather than miss some. So it sounds like there's I think, I think yeah, and there's and from very very simple changes to more complicated okay. cases. So you mentioned scenarios, I thought you were gonna say something else to we get all the scenarios. Well so I I, I think and we've, we have been changing when I completely restructured the PR recently, so, um, and we've added new people, so, which I really appreciate you guys coming because of having the additional perspective on things. But I think we need to be more comfortable with what exactly are the scenarios that we're talking about, adding some, tweaking some, 
being more having more clarity around it. Um, I don't think we're far off. I think we just need to make sure that we're all sure that they're there. And, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's just ramping up, right? Because they can't yeah. work with containers all the time. Yeah, but I also I think, how, you know, what is the context? Justin was unclear about what the mirroring things were about, right. for example, because I, mean, because I think there was a lot of context. There's a lot of context in that from the people who have been dealing with registry mirroring issues for a long time, for example. And I think it's just expressing it in quite um, generic terms, which helps a people who are not familiar with containers, for example, because it's a, I mean, I think, because the problem is similar to other problems, and there's a lot of overlap with other problems, but um, we just need to make sure that we clearly express the bits that are really important and different, and therefore might need different treatment from other problems in the bits that are just generic terms, types of thing. <clears throat> okay, so time check. Where are we? Where are people at? Where do we want to take this from here? The next steps. Are we having uh, another in person meeting next week, or is that going to be a problem? We could. Um, so Justin's actually in the UK. So no, I'm not, I'm curious enough. Oh, well, actually, you're here next, next week. I'm not sure if I'm safe <laughs> for a call. <laughs> So Justin's based in the UK. He's <laughs> um, you know, Docker's in Cali, and he's got a couple of customers up here. Do you guys still have your office up here? We well, don't anywhere, no. I need to leave in about half an hour, I think. Okay. You have dinner plans? No, I can't see. I can't get it. Oh, oh, okay. Um, All flights were canceled. This is good. Uh, I just don't know how long it takes to get anywhere. Okay. And what time do I actually? Support and bagel like preview. What did I just hover over here? <laughs> get some visualizations. There you go. I see Vincent's name hover over here. Yes, no, it's Sam. Okay. I the brain process the length of your characters to be Vincent Babs. <laughs> well, when you look at the characters, it seems like they're spacing one. Yeah, I need to leave it to the uh, 15, 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, okay. All right, so why don't we spend a little time to talk about some next steps then? So, um, we obviously need to, you know, get past some of those scenarios because it sounds like at least we're agreeing that we need to skip that solid because we're. We wound up spinning some design conversations and agreeing that we're not really solid on the scenario. So I, I actually think our biggest challenge is going to keep is by keeping the same people. Because I've watched this with the S bomb working group, is every time I dial into the call, they're re -hash rehashing the same thing. So new people joined in. So I'm hoping that you guys will continue yeah. so that the next time we have this conversation, we can just pick up where we left off. I don't think, yeah, I don't think we're far off. I think we're just, yeah. just uh, making sure that we're. Happy. Um, we might be able to do something else. Uh, uh, you're hoping for your next week's schedule? Um, we certainly have a holiday next week, but I know. I might, I might be around, I, uh, I might be around on Wednesday morning, I'm not sure. I have to find out. I'll probably know tomorrow. So we might, we could potentially have a meeting on Wednesday morning. Or, Okay, I'll be back. I think he's back next week also, so we can join in that, uh, the SBOM, that other SBOM conversation. Um, or possibly Monday afternoon. Actually, yeah, Monday afternoon is also possible. Let me just check when I'm watching it. Okay. Sounds good. One question then for yeah. open actions. When we walk down to pick up the team, I thought the other Justin was describing revocation questions or concerns that I don't see up there. Or is that it's all resolved? Or no, it's no, it's a scenario I need to add. Okay. There's definitely a revocation scenario that okay. I, if I even still have it in the scenarios, I glossed over it. So okay. I need to be more, much more explicit. Um, so I, this is a 
it's a collection of notes. I wouldn't even say it's everything. It's just so sort of okay. By all means, well, someone in the threat model. So, okay. There was some there too. Yeah, yeah. So I but I will call explicitly that. out that hey, I've got something out deployed, but yet this key for bad company got revoked. And you know, uh, no. <laughs> well, at least try. I mean, hit. We don't. We may not. I, don't, I, I think that that's. I think we should. That's quite explicit about assuming implementation questions. So, uh, the, I think. Is it implicit, or is that a yeah. key? Like the whole thing, were based on. You know, keys that it, the whole idea is that I can uh, yeah, trust and revoke these something. These things are intrinsically linked. Well, right? You don't want to say revoke keys yeah. as much as you're saying we're revoking trust. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. we're revoking trust yeah. to be worked out later. Yeah. Yeah. We struggle with that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I've got scars to prove it. This was pain. But I think there's, a, there's some wording around. Recovery of trust and things in the throat before. Okay. I mean, maybe things, maybe some of these things aren't in the right place, and you know, feel free to open PL to move things around or add things. I mean, I think that's we can if we can clean up the things in the repo between now and next week as well. But yeah, as well. I think that we need to do that to have a productive conversation, right? And possibly a regroup next week, depending on your availability. Yeah. And yeah. you know, worst case, you can dial in. We'll figure out a, a time that we can do a dial in. It's just obviously, I mean, from a box. I think, I mean, I would, yeah, Monday afternoon might be the best option because I've got to be here. Like, I think I've got to be here on Monday evening anyway. So, okay. yeah, I've definitely got to be here. I've got another meeting on Tuesday, so I'm going to be in the evening time. So I'm probably might as well come here. Okay, so I'm available Monday also. In fact, we have our ten. Well, that's not the afternoon, but um, yeah. I can do Monday. Not, not in the morning. No, do you travel in the morning or just sleeping? Uh, well, I was thinking of coming. Yeah, and let's. I'll let me right. just let me like. I'll let you know, but I wasn't thinking of coming on the really early flight. Okay. Right. So we meet in Amazon office. Uh, yeah. It can be, yeah, it's back to you guys. It's fine. I don't care. Okay. Um, while we wrap up, this way you can pack up whatever you need. And thank you for coming. I think if we just next week get the use cases nailed down and then the what are we signing question has been that would be a good start and lead and probably to the other. The interesting thing is what are we signing? I keep on thinking we're signing the artifacts, you know, the thing that's in the registry, but I, I think we're struggling on what defining like where how do you reference something that means I'm trying to tease apart and it's only because this thing is already out in the wild. Yeah. So how do you Segment something that there's existing workflows that people use already. Yeah. But I think once we get that, those two things out, that'll be a little bit easier to get to the naming and signing part. And I think everything else will start to come down after that. You all set? Thank you. You don't need to get out? Yeah, I, I know. Okay. Okay. Walk around with us. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. so, so, don't get me fired. So, <laughs> bleeding hard today. So, oh, shit, I just took a picture of us all sitting together. Who just lost? Two. Two. Justin. 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 I mean, he took himself, but yeah. yeah. He looked like he was running out of here. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, the, uh, traffic. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what the rush is to sit in traffic, exactly. I was going to say something to Justin about that, but I was like, you know what? Let's not complicate it. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, I guess we have to have the meeting again just so we can have a better picture. We keep on forgetting the pictures. It's funny because I even brought, because my cell phone camera has gotten pretty junked up, so I brought the this other real camera just to make sure I can get a good picture. Did we get one last time? Huh? Did we get a picture last time? Somebody grabs one in the second room that we wound up in, uh, and then I had one from the spheres uh, oh, nice. that I posted. Um, I don't think you made, did you make the spheres? I didn't make the spheres. It's the run for a meeting. So we lost. Um, the woman from JFrog. Yeah. And to get this comparable, I think that's
<laughs> should we come back to that? That's right. Should we have yeah, yeah. pictures of like each one of those tapes? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Let's talk about priorities on these things. And forget what we're talking about. I need to get a picture next time. Do we want to have more updates than just Microsoft, Amazon, and Docker? I have invited. Okay. They're choosing whether they have right. time to focus or not. So um, I think this is a minimal to make sure we have, you know, at least two clouds and uh, at least the history, you know, what we built. Um, but John Johnson, he couldn't make it, and the other folks that uh, represent the registry, they couldn't. Um, it's the end of the year for Red Hat. Oh, was that? Um, that was going to be your time. Should we hang up the phone? Oh, yeah.